Welcome to the Dog Trainers Podcast. A podcast created by dog trainers, for dog trainers, or anyone who's ever fallen in love with man's best friend. Hey, everybody. Welcome back, and thank you so much for listening to the Dog Trainers Podcast. Mariano Alvarez here with Brent Labrada, and another very special guest we'll be announcing in just a second. But first, we do want to thank you guys so, so much for your support. We love you guys, and thank you guys. This is Season 2, Episode 12, and with that, over to you, man. What's up, guys? This is Brent with the Dog Trainers Podcast, and we are so stoked for our next guest. It's been a while trying to reach out to him, uh, and we finally were able to lock our schedules in. Um, With no further ado, I want to introduce Mr. Robert Cabral. Uh, Those of you guys who know him, you guys know that you're already following him on Instagram, at Robert Cabral. It's Robert, last name Cabral, C-A-B-R-A-L. You guys could also check him out at www.robertcabral.com and also at YouTube, at Robert Cabral. Um, And uh, welcome, Robert. How are you, man? I'm great. Thanks. Nice to be here. Thank you so yeah, much for joining us. us. Yeah, man. Not it's, really it's here. There, Thank you, you know for joining I mean? us. <laughs> um, you know, it, uh, I've yeah. been wanting to reach out to you for months because I know the the great amount of rescue work that you do. Um, you know, my career started working at shelters and, you know, we can get into that a little bit later, how I got involved. And so um, I was first, you know, I've seen your content for years and then specifically, you know, the last year, year and a half, we've, you know, as we've done this dog training podcast, there's a lot of people who are like, do you know, Robert Cabral? And I was like, I've heard the name and I've seen some of his videos, but I haven't really done a deep dive into Robert. And honestly, man, the more I went into your content and your videos and your approach and just like you're, you're a very grounded, real and no bullshit kind of guy. And I think the dog training is missing that right especially modern day dog trainers and so super happy that you're here and would love to pick your brain and get to know your story a little bit and um and yeah i mean is anything you want to ask me before i keep going mariano all right so here we go no let's let's start at the beginning your audience is young dog trainers so they want to know how you started they want to know where you know what you were doing before dog training talk to us about this origin story of who Robert Cabral is as a man and as a dog trainer. Um, you know, the, well, the, the core of who I am is, is a person who I, I, you know, I feel I was given a gift and I wanted to make something of it. I started out really my, my, my strongest background is martial arts. I've been involved in the martial Mm -hmm. arts since I was a kid. I came to um, the United States when I was maybe, I think about seven eight years old, couldn't speak the language, got beat up every day. My mom put me in martial arts classes. From Germany. From Germany. Yeah. Um, So I always had this, I was was kind of a victim. I got beat up, but I didn't play the role. I kind of got stronger, learned martial arts, took care of myself, and I took care of situations. Was back in Jersey, moved to Florida, lived in in Florida for about eight years or so, and uh, then moved to California. So as a martial artist, I worked as a bodyguard. I was, a, I was teaching mm-hmm. karate, had a big karate school in Los Angeles. Um, mm. Loved, loved, loved teaching martial arts, teaching adults, teaching kids, um, and stuff like that. But um, my real passion was always animals. I just, I, I had a thing about animals. I loved to, you know, to be able to do something different. And about, I think it was in 2000, I mean, in the 90s and stuff, I'd, in the early 2000s, a friend of mine had a Doberman Pinscher, my friend Mike, and nice. I helped him train the dog. He kind of taught me some things, very, you know, crass, right. old school, Keeler type stuff, which worked, but, but um, I mm-hmm. did it anyway. And mm-hmm. um, I, was, I was doing photography, and I went into the shelters, and I would take pictures of the dogs and make these little videos. Mm-hmm. They were called, you know, shelter angel videos. And they're, they're still alive on YouTube if you go through the Bound Angels channel. And more than 200 of these animals wow. all got homes because of good wow. exposure, right? This was like, think about 2007, you just started. You know, where Facebook yeah. and YouTube and everything was. And I was doing these really right, creative right. videos, right? Just starting out. So, um, but the secret to it was I had these dogs out and I was before performing like a behavior mm-hmm. uh, assessment on them, like a temperament test. I was touching, I was handling, I was giving them treats. I was seeing if they would mm-hmm. be lured into a down, into a sit. Um, I would put four or five dogs in a yard and see, let them play. So all those things were behaviors that you would want to see if you're going to bring this dog home to, you know, mm-hmm. your child or, you know, or your family. So there was a couple of dogs that I kind of took a liking to. I had a <laughs> Sharpe at the time named Silly, and I really wanted a Belgian Malinois. And I did my research, not like people are going to right. watch this movie and want a Belgian Malinois, but I did a lot of research. I wanted a dog that would challenge me. 
Mm. You know, and having coming from the martial arts and being a real strong personality, I want a dog that's going to challenge me physically and mentally. And of all the research I did, it was going to be a German Shepherd. And then I mm -hmm. stumbled upon the Malinois. I said, it's got to be a Malinois. Mm. So I rescued six different Malinois from um, L.A. City shelters and tried to make them all work in my life. Mm. And they wouldn't because they wouldn't get along with my Sharpe. So I was working with a Belgian Malinois rescue, a lady named Terry, who I'm still friends with. And um, I see her at dog shows now all the time. She's got, does she have a turf or does she have a, I think she has a turf. <laughs> I'm asking my wife because she knows more than I know. Um, and so she said, you really should buy a dog. <clears throat> and so in the meantime, all these Malinois, I needed to get them health certificates because we got them out to be cell phone detection dogs and, and you know, and narcotics detection dogs. Um, some pets, some went to other organizations. And mm. my vet said, who's training these dogs? And they were Malinois and they were sharp. Yeah, very hard, really hard two breeds. very obstinate, yep. tough breeds to work with. Right, right. Right, really hard breeds. And so my vet says, you should be a dog trainer. And I said, I'm not going <laughs> to screw up another hobby. I really like doing it. You know, I screwed up my martial arts hobby by making it a business. Um, but that's the, the, the short of it. She was a vet in Malibu and she said, you know, you should really start training dogs. And she just started sending people my number. She just gave them my number and they said, you know, Dr. Lisa said, you can help me. And I said, I'm not a dog trainer, but yeah. apparently I, I was, and I became one and, um, greatest thing I ever did. I mean, my, um, my wife and I met because of my re-entry into dog training. We were friends. She studied martial arts with me and we, we dated we broke up and then we kind That's of awesome. saw each other and like rekindled. So yeah. the dog thing has done everything great in my life. So um, mm. brought me my dogs, brought me my wife, brought me this great career I have, which I just love doing. Um, yeah. And it's just by following a passion, you know, by following what you really love and what, what you're good at. So was that, was that the difference? Was that dog training was just what you really loved? Is that why you were able to keep it as a passion, even though it's also a business? Yeah, I, I, I do think so. I think, um, I think, you know, with dogs, especially when you look at competitive dog trainers, which I mm -hmm. have been and I have done, um, I think at some point, whether you're training, and I'm, I'm not talking about your own personal dog, because mm -hmm. we're, we're talking here about dog trainers, right? Sure. When right. you're a dog trainer, whether you're training pets or mm -hmm. shelter dogs or competitive dogs, you make a decision. There's a little switch that goes mm -hmm. off in your mind. It's either mm -hmm. about the business or it's about the animal. Mm -hmm. right? It's very rare it can be about both. And mm. like in sports, oftentimes mm -hmm. it's really about the sport. Right. So right. you make that decision that, you know what, this dog is not right for the sport. Mm -hmm. I need to get rid of that dog and get another dog. And so you rehome that dog or sell that dog or trade that dog or mm -hmm. whatever and get another dog. And right. in the business of dog training, you make this decision that mm -hmm. these dogs are dollars, you know, and, and, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. People always downplay that. They say, well, this guy's just in business to make money. Well, mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the only reason anybody's mm -hmm. in business. Right. Right? Everybody's I in mean, business to make money. That's what business is. Yeah. We have a real bad um, stigma on money where people say, they well, it's terrible. He's just in business to make money. Well, I don't want to deal with right. somebody in business right. who's not in business to make money. Right. So do, as a young dog trainer, you definitely should not fault yourself. You should try to get right. exactly what you're worth. Right. And right. aspire and to be And make sure that you're more. adding the value to match. Well, right? there's, there's no shame in that. There's, I was never ashamed of charging um, the fees right. I charged because I was worth right. it. And I was always worth more. And I always um, up my game to become better. Well, see, so, so that's one of the things that I want to I want to put a pin in for later, because these are the things that I want to ask an experienced trainer, like how to how to discover what you're worth and pricing and things like that, because newer trainers struggle with that to no end. Right. I wanted mm -hmm. to get your thoughts on something as you were talking about dog training being that real passion and that you've been able all this all this time all these years to keep it as a passion even though it has been a business we went out to new york and we met with a few trainers one of them was tyler mudo and he was telling us it's about punished by rewards that talked about exactly that right and it was punished by rewards and it was you know like the example was if you're an artist you just love painting right but you start selling your paintings if you love painting just on its own that is yeah. the reward, right? You just, it feels good to do. But then you start selling your paintings. Now making money is the new reward and it replaces the reward of painting. And it, it like you said, it loses the passion for the business side of it. So I, I want to know, how did you manage to keep this one in line? Because I know it's your real passion, but I'm sh still sure that there were some difficulties there. Well, difficulty as far as what? what like like what, what lessons did you learn in, in other things that, that made you, that allowed you to keep this one right down the middle of passion and business at the same time? Mm. Yeah, I never go through mm -hmm. like the motivational coach thing, right? 
Okay. I don't like. I don't mm-hmm. aspire to listen mm-hmm. to Anthony mm-hmm. Robbins. I mean, he's probably a nice guy, but I think so many dog trainers I've seen, and, and I'm not singling out Tyler, and I'm not. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if this is Tyler's thing. I don't think it is. Tyler and I have always had a very good relationship. So, um, so many dog trainers um, kind of go to the side of, oh, you know, da da da, da and like they're suddenly, you know, Anthony sure. Robbins in in a dog trainer's suit, and they're telling you how yeah. to do this and how how successful they are and, and all this stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, I just think you have to be real. You know what I mean? It's like in a friendship, in a romance, in a, tr- a relationship of training, right. you have to be genuine and, and, and right. it will come, you'll make money, you know, um, and you, w- you want to hear a great motivational quote that I read 50 years ago. And mm-hmm. it was, um, you can have anything in the world you want if you help mm-hmm. enough other people in the world get what they want. Mm-hmm. That's really mm. the truth of life, right? Mm. The truth of life is do good things and good things will come on to you. And if good things yeah. don't come on to you, just you know, keep that... doing good things. Well, that shouldn't stop you. You shouldn't be motivated um, because of one or the other, mm-hmm. but you certainly need to make money. You certainly right. need to live a good life if you want to continue. If you love dog training and then you're suddenly start making money with it, embrace mm-hmm. that part of it, accept it. Don't think it's like, oh, now I'm more interested yep. in making money than in training dogs. Yeah. Just take that you as know, there's an the interesting reward. subject. We, we got to go cover the Larry Crone and Joel Silverman and Jay Jack seminar uh, last weekend, actually. Um, and mm-hmm. Jay Jack brought up the this these concepts that he called the sport trap and the art trap. And I think there might be a third trap, which is the business trap, if you know where I'm going with this, Mariana. So, so pretty much what the art trap and the, for the mm-hmm. audience, uh, the art trap versus the sport trap, because Jay Jack did a lot of martial arts, you know, his whole life as well. And one thing that he talked about was he says, originally martial arts started as uh, like a practical way of defending yourself and your family, right? That's originally how martial arts started. But through the years, people would you know, try to standardize it. And then in order to standardize it, you have to start keeping track of technique and rhythm and all this other stuff. And then little by little, we start seeing what was originally a practical form of self-defense now starts becoming a sport because people are now keeping tabs and scoring and then competing against each other for a trophy or a title or whatever it might be. But what happens is sometimes in certain, in certain martial arts, just getting a touch on the shoulder that gets you a point in a sport versus actually hurting the person or defending yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And so he said that's called a sports trap where no longer Mm -hmm. what that grand champion is doing actually works in real life anymore, right? And, or it can, but to an extent, not a real street fight, right? And then he talked about the art trap Mm -hmm. where he talked about, you know, the funny example he gave was like, let's say someone's doing Kung Fu or Judo or something. And then someone said, you know, you need to go slower go a little slower. And he goes, and then 30, 40 years later, someone develops Tai Chi out of that slower martial art. And little by little, we start seeing that same original discipline starts drifting more towards the side of art. And now someone wants to see how far they can go with this new approach, taking the fundamentals, but now changing them. And on both sides, the art trap and the sports trap, it stops lo- it starts losing the original purpose of that martial art. Right. Let's just start with those two things. Is this something because as a, as a professional martial artist, you know, is that something you agree with or that you can see the reason behind it? Well, if you look at the way modern uh, karate was formed, right, it was mm-hmm. um, the idea behind it was martial karate or just Tay, which was originally called. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The idea was that this was, as you said, a combative art form, a military mm-hmm. budo. Bu means military or martial, and mm-hmm. that really means the art of fighting. The only reason um, it was really able to, to grow and to prosper was because of the sport and the art trap that, you know, like as you're referring to, mm-hmm. as Jay mm-hmm. referred to it too. Um, there, there is a good side and a bad side to that. And mm-hmm. I, I agree with him. I, I think mm-hmm. that, that in, in essence, it kind of watered it down. But in mm-hmm. reality, it kind of made it grow. Mm-hmm. So in, all in the ways, benefits, yeah. right? All the benefits that are there to the martial arts can now be used to help so many more people. Where mm-hmm. you know get, the perfect example is my wife, right? When she studied mm-hmm. with me, you know, twenty-five plus years ago, 
she's a beautiful woman. She's not going to go in there and, and you know, and, and knock knock blocks with you know, with my, my friend Robin forehead. Willison, right? Right. <laughs> it's right, a funny right, story right. She said. But but because there is an art form to it and you can pull those punches and you can learn and you can grow through the spiritual and emotional growth that martial arts offers, then mm -hmm. um, other people can benefit from it and children can learn discipline and self-control and they don't need to take it to the military level. It's like I can go mm -hmm. shoot at a shooting range, which is probably going to ban this video from YouTube now because I said shooting. <laughs> but I can <laughs> go shoot okay. sports we all shoot shooting guns. range. Right? Yeah, yeah, well, so do I. But, yeah. um, but I don't have to go out and go to war right. and be shot yeah. at, right? And now I'm just shooting a mm -hmm. target of a silhouette, and that guy isn't really shooting back at me. So right. yes and no. I, I think I want to I look at the glasses half full on this one and say mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. these sport trap, and I, I like that analogy. I think it's really, really mm -hmm. well stated. I think he made a really good mm -hmm. assessment there. Mm -hmm. um, and the art trap have actually enhanced it to grow more. Now, that Definitely. person who goes out and goes target shooting once a week should in no way think he's you know a special forces guy or a Navy SEAL, right, right, and he's going to go right. to fight the war, because he's not, right? Because right. as soon as like the car backfires, he's going to be peeing his pants. Right. right. But it gives him the out and, and some discipline and some enjoyment mm -hmm. out of it. And I think with dog training, we really kind of need to get away from, yeah, I've, I've dealt with severely aggressive dogs in shelters more than mm -hmm. most anybody I know. But mm -hmm. that doesn't make me any better than the woman who's 75 years old, who's training her border collie in AKC obedience. She's right. got, she, she's got skin in the game too, and she's doing something really right. wonderful. So it's, it, right. it can prosper and it can, it can help a lot more. You know, that so is if I, sorry, real quick. So if I'm hearing you correctly, so, and then this is what J Jack uh, also agrees with you as well. He was talking about how, you know, the the efficacy and techniques and all that stuff did get sharper through sports and the understanding that you don't have to be so, you know, like the art side opened up new techniques and new avenues. So it does grow. And I think his final premise was learning how to ride in the middle, right? Because we know what happens when people get too much in the sports trap, especially in dog training, right? You're constantly doing flip finishes for a pet dog, <laughs> you know, you're constantly mm -hmm. doing like precision work for a dog who's a pet dog. Right? right. And on the art trap, you know, maybe some people are, are leaning too much into a methodology because they're treating it like a religion versus as a tool set, a set mm -hmm. of skills that could work in a different context. Right. Um, but anyway, sorry to cut you off, Mario. I just wanted to clarify that. No, 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 you're good. Let's get your thoughts on that, Rob. Robert. Well, yeah. okay, Robert. you know, Sorry. a lot of times what happens is, and, and I see this a lot, I mean, there's a lot of really great um, sport trainers, mm -hmm. but that skill is not necessarily something that you need to help the, a pet dog, right? right? So in other words, the dog should, you know, I mean, essentially all pet dogs or all dogs that are kept, you know, a, a, with us as pets should have three skills. A solid stay, a solid recall, and a solid leave it. Besides that, yeah. everything else is icing on the cake. 100%. So, yeah. so dogs don't need it. Now, it's certainly fun to be able to teach your dog, you know, something fun, a rollover, a flip finish, or, you know, leg weave or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, right. Mm -hmm. But it, it doesn't need to be there. So I think, and, and this is going into exactly what you're, what you're asking about, is this whole idea of the sport trap that people think, well, okay, I'm a great trainer and I'm going to show you how I can make your dog. I've won all these medals. Yeah. yeah, I've won all these medals and stuff. And, you know, look, let me tell you something. For people who say, and, you know, Oscar Mora and I talked about this, he said, you know, people downplay the sport. And that's really a, a bad move because a lot of pet dog mm -hmm. trainers, could, and, and I know there's a lot of pet dog trainers who've never put a CD on a dog, a, com a companion dog, title mm -hmm. on a dog. And that ain't right. easy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you, if you're going to tell me you're a, a dog trainer, and there's a lot of them out there that say they're dog trainers, but all they are is no guys or no women. And all they teach mm -hmm. dogs is like, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Mm -hmm. And like, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want to be married to somebody like that. And you certainly don't want to live with somebody like that if you're a dog. 100%. So right. a, a trainer, in my opinion, should, it's like, think of a fitness trainer, right? You don't go to mm -hmm. a fitness trainer who says, don't eat that, don't do this, don't do this. You go to a fitness trainer who says, okay, this is what you should eat. This is the exercise you should do. This is how much sleep you should get. This is how you should look mm -hmm. at life. So when I'm a, a mm -hmm. dog trainer, I'm essentially that dog's coach. Mm -hmm. I want to teach him things to do. I want to teach him how mm -hmm. to do this and how mm -hmm. to do that before I start teaching a dog how not to do things. 
Right. And, you know, little skills. Like you, you look at these some, some of these women who are in their 70s and 80s at these AKC trials doing some pretty mm-hmm. damn amazing They're stuff killer. with their dogs. Right? And I'm They're not being killer. sexist women. There's guys too, but it's mostly women. Yeah, sure. But, um, I, will, but I will say something. In my most mm-hmm. advanced classes that I teach, it is mm-hmm. 99% women in those highly advanced classes. Yeah. Like in, in like yeah. tricks or off-leash obedience. Like I get a lot of women in my classes. So women have they, a better way with dogs. So here's the real secret. Like mm-hmm. every, anybody will tell you this. If you're going to raise a dog to do something, and, and let's say the sport, let's say it's ring sport or, or, or you know, uh, IP or AGP, mm-hmm. you really want a woman to be the original person who has her hands on that dog. And the reason for that is, is a woman is more compassionate. She's more forgiving. She lets the dog kind of get away with stuff and be a little naughty. Mm-hmm. So that builds an immense amount of confidence in a dog. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And a great example of that is our dog, Dwayne. He's like one of the best dogs I've ever seen. I've, and I've seen tens of thousands of dogs. He's one of the best dogs mm-hmm. I've ever seen. Best bred, best trained, best dog. He right. was raised by my wife and she let him get away with stuff that was really kind of naughty, right? That I mm-hmm. wouldn't have. I would have like put the kibosh on it. But I said, look, it's right. her dog. Let her do this. This is her project and it's her love. And I let it go as an experiment. Right. And I saw that this dog has a brazen amount of confidence. Right. You can correct mm-hmm. the dog hard and he's like, I got it. What do you want to do? Mm. He doesn't cower yeah. like, oh, God, I'm in trouble. Right. And now right. it's one solid breeding, obviously, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. two solid uh, training and raising. Mm-hmm. The, the, and, and then she she had that. That was her thing. You know, I came in right. later and helped her with some stuff and stuff. But, you know, this is ninety nine point nine percent her handiwork and her skill. So women have that ability. And, and this is where you kind of got to divide these lines. You got to say men are often too hard on puppies, right? True. We start, don't do this, don't do Impatient. that. Yeah. I'm a 200 pound guy. If I'm telling an 11 pound dog not to do that, he's like, oh, geez, the end of the world is coming. Right. So, and I so women too, can, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Women can do something, you know, can bring a lot to the table in this. And this is why a lot of times you see when a woman has a really good dog, their ability to train and interact and get these results out are surpa- much better than men. They surpass men's skills because men's skills are oftentimes too hard and too dominant. Mm-hmm. And I noticed too I that a big problem with men clients that I have is uh, they, maybe this is part of the reason why they're too hard, is they like have a way of being aloof about it or lazy about it or whatever you want to call it. Like they don't, they don't address something until they're annoyed enough to address it firmly. But mm-hmm. at this point it's just because they're like their emotional annoyance causes them to be like, yeah. oh, stop it. You know? Yeah. 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 Because they, it, they just kind of let it roll. Is it fair to say that women are more, and again, this is a generalization, so please don't yell at us. Um, <laughs> women Trust care me, more you, about, As soon as you said women, yeah, you're, you're going to yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Is it true that women are blank? Uh, canceled. Um, canceled. Is it true that women care more about relationships versus men care more about results? It's a general statement. I would think, sure. you know, I think the way I always refer to this is the, going back to the martial arts, the yin and the yang. Mm. Yeah. Right. There's plenty yeah. of women who are probably more, do- well, maybe not more dominant than me, but more dominant than a lot of guys. Sure. Right. So yeah. I think it's the yin and the yang. It's the yin right. element, the female element, the, the, the softer element, the more flowing element mm. of, of engagement that makes Adaptive, the dog fluid. more confident and, and, and yeah. nurturing. It's the yang right. element that brings out that fight drive, that confidence, mm-hmm. that, that ability to, to challenge and stuff like that. So you need, I love that. you know, as they say in the Tao, you need the, the good and the bad, the black and the white, the strong and the weak, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 mm-hmm. the, the positive and the negative. You need all of those things. Yeah. In training a dog. No, so that. sometimes you just need to get in touch with your feminine side and to, to embrace that. A lot of women, yeah. you know, who are doing the bite sports, I mean, you know, and there are women, Ann Kent is, is, is you know, a, 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 a great decoy. And there's mm-hmm. a lot of other ones where mm-hmm. you actually see these women who are as strong as most guys taking bites from dogs. But for the most right. part, they're not. So this is a cohesive thing where, you, you know, people need to come together and we don't need to be apart and say, oh, you know, this, that, or that, that. It, this is, it's, it's a sure. sport, it's, a, it's an endeavor, and it's something that we can all benefit from. Yeah. Allow me to pull so, us out of hot water here. So yeah, yeah, go. let's, uh, I, I wanted to touch on something that, that you were talking about. Maybe a little bit. Like, <laughs> oh, hot water, I get it. <laughs> why did that take you so long? <laughs> Sorry, I was, I, was, I was looking at my notes, and then I was like, oh, I tuned back in. 
Um, I did want to circle back to the trap stuff. So after exactly. your question, right. Answer. So, so yeah. cool. when we were talking about the sport trap versus art trap, I was fascinated with your, your take on it because essentially, um, uh, I think your take on it is, uh, is more or less what my take on it was, which was like, I get it and I can see the logic in it. And I don't think that Jay's wrong, but I don't, but I think you're right that there's benefit to it though. Not only does sport broaden it out to a wider audience, but maybe art finds a different, doing things in a different medium gives people different understandings of, of benefits of it, right? And, yeah. and then there's the whole argument of like, there's purists of anything. And then there's other people who are like, well, why shouldn't I dabble in different things? That's what life is for, right? Yeah. So it is kind of fascinating. And, yeah. and I wanted to get your take essentially on, we were talking about sport obedience, right? Like sport dog training. And we were talking about pet dog training and how sometimes pet dog trainers focus too much on sport, but it's good. I would imagine, you know, and I want your thoughts, right? Like it's good to kind of dabble in this and dabble in that and really see what's what and kind of come up with your own idea for things. Well, I mean, I mean certainly if you're a dog trainer, you should have an understanding of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know if you need to dabble in it. I mean, I have dabbled in everything from, you know, severely aggressive dogs, shelter dogs, pet dogs, to competitive protection dogs, obedience dogs, mm -hmm. uh, AKC, mm -hmm. as well as Mondial Ring, uh, IGP, IPO, um, as well as, you know, other things. I, I mean, I just mm -hmm. always feel like I just want the information. And it, it will depend on the level of trainer you are. If you have the ability to communicate to somebody um, these different aspects of a dog's nature because all sp all dogs the sports really should take into account the dog's natural drives and abilities mm -hmm. right? and those mm -hmm. are the ability to bite which is one the ability yeah. to use its nose two and the ability to have a relationship with a person three that's the obedience so the three fields are and if you look at igp i think really has it wrapped up the best although it's the most complex and it's, it's kind of very hard to apply but Hmm. tracking the dog uses its number one sense, which is its nose, its, its ability to scent. Mm -hmm. Two, um, the dog uses its ability for to protect or to fight in protection. Mm -hmm. And number mm -hmm. three, the dog uses its ability to bond what, what we've really bred these dogs to do right. in obedience. So if you really want right. to be well-versed in dog training, you should understand the, the basics of what what a dog is and why these sports are important they're not nonsense in any way they're right, not right, nonsense right right um, right as a trainer i think you should know that and you should be able to do more than just put a collar on a dog and pop them and you know give them a correction or just jam treats down their face right, there's, 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 right. i don't care which right. side you're on on this on this argument um but many on both sides don't have the understanding of the basic skill set that really goes into something like, and like for, for example, five or 10 years ago, everybody was an aggressive dog trainer, but I never mm -hmm. saw any of those people at the shelter. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. they, would, they would say they're aggressive dog trainers and they would have a bite sleeve or a bite suit, but they, mm -hmm. they have no idea like why a dog is biting, mm -hmm. the components, the drives, the elements, mm -hmm. the behaviors that, that make it happen. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just a weak argument to me. And I just feel sorry for the people who hire these people and get ripped off by them. But right. you know, certainly if you work with somebody who, uh, who understands that and who's worked with bite dogs, whether it's in, in police work or, or, or in, in sport work, you would probably have a better idea of it or shelter work. Right. hundred percent, hundred percent. So one thing I wanted to propose, so now that we kind of brought up these ideas of traps, the art trap, the sport trap, would you guys say that there is a bit of a business trap that sometimes happens, right? Like like as we talked about once you have to once you start charging or your validation of your art is based on how much you can sell it for how much money you can make sometimes that passion gets crushed you know or sometimes it gets uh, dwindled down you know and now it starts becoming about the bottom line or it starts becoming about the followers that you get or it starts becoming about you know things like that where it's more about this brand and this business and you know i i could definitely see there are dog trainers out there that, um, you know, they haven't put the reps in and they haven't put, you know, the amount of effort, you know, that, that, that you've put in, in your career, uh, but they still want to charge the same prices or they still want to, you know, be mentors to other people and sell online programs and things like that, which again, free market, free business. But 
What do you feel about the business trap? If we were to unravel that, well, let's do you call feel it that it exists? Trap. Let's call it the mm. ego trap because that's mm. really what okay. it is, right? I mean, like there I charge go. more than you. I've got more followers than you. Like I don't mm -hmm. really care about followers. I mean, I look at it like you know, like it's it's funny to me that I I never even started noticing until I went over a hundred thousand followers on YouTube subscribers. Um, right. I, I you know what I like about my followers is they really know who I am. Mm. Yeah. At the core, they're not following me because I'm like posing with celebrities. Like I hate celebrities, right? Yeah. I, I hate all mm -hmm. that. But mm -hmm. they they really they really know who I am at the core. So it's not an ego. It's not I'm just trying to pretend some, something. I am that person. Right. And, um, and I think that's the real important part of it that, you know, you, you should, and again, people can't, right? We all know the guy mm -hmm. who's the scammer, who's got the business proposal and he's raising money and he's doing this mm -hmm. and he's doing that, or he's driving the least, you know, Mercedes trying to pick up the hot girl or he's, right. you know, whatever, right? We all know those people. We got the, you know, the people who are, promoting their online program and they've got a really great social media eye for things and it looks mm -hmm. great. I, the, the, the only thing that upsets me about that is the people who get taken, you know, by mm. that person and, and put their dog in that person's care. And then their dog is just, you know, kept in a crate for 24 hours and taken out for 20 minute runs and just fried on an e-collar because we're doing right. off leash work or we're doing this. Or right. Right. That. I, I'm not a big fan of board and trains, I'll tell you right now. And I know a lot of mm -hmm. trainers mm -hmm. are going to really poo poo me on this. But, you know, mm -hmm. here's the thing you've got a dog, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. don't send your kid to boarding school. Well, some people do, right? You know, send your kid <laughs> yeah. to boarding school and they come back 18 years later and they're like this, like they're, you know, like a great person. Um, yeah. Man, I mean, get a, get a grip. Like, have a hand in raising your dog. Train your right. dog. Take an obedience class, right? It's so much right. better to take a class and be involved in it. Your dog might not be as well trained, but you're certainly going to have a better bond with them. Sending your dog away, I mean, dog trainers make a lot. There's a big, that's where there's a big sum of money. You can make a lot of money by, right. by taking people's dogs to the, your houses. And I'm not poo-pooing if there's dog trainers out there who want to be board and train trainers. Um, your mental game should be I am going to give this dog a solid quality experience all the way mm -hmm. around, not just mm -hmm. take them out, yank them around, you know, hunting dog 100%. trainers. They yep. take these dogs out. They're living in a truck. They're going from city to city. They get out 15 minutes. They get fried twice. You know, they get two retrieves and they get put back in the truck. That's mm -hmm. bull. It's really mm -hmm. crappy yeah. training. And, and board and train trainers do it too. They got the dog. The dog mm -hmm. has food aggression issues. They put an e-collar on it. They fry the dog. Um, mm -hmm. And then they return the dog. And that really falls apart. Here's the sad yeah. part. You're going to lose your money. But more importantly, you're going to lose the spirit of your dog. Yeah. Right? And as yeah. a trainer, your job should be to make that dog the very, very best it can be. Right. Not right. the best you can make it, because you might not be able to make it that good, but that, make that dog the best he can be or she can be. That's well, where the quality I comes in. Well, can I play devil's advocate really quick? I feel like yeah, go ahead. I feel like from a trainer's perspective, uh, trainers who do private lessons and board and trains, I feel like it helps them in their training because of the the momentum is so different. Like doing a lesson with the client, and, not, and that's a that's something I want to talk to you more about. Like like teaching ability, right? But also being able to focus um, with my assistants and Brent and I have trained assistants in the past together. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've noticed the final thing that it takes an assistant trainer to learn other than like client stuff is they learn each individual module of training with whatever different tools. And, you know, the hardest thing for them to figure out is how to put it all into one program. When do I move from one to two and two to three? And it's kind of fun to, to, uh, for them to have that sort of opportunity right. to, to figure that curriculum out, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I can propose, let's actually take a quick commercial break and I'd love to get, you know, we're always looking to improve our own practices and everything. And we'd love to explain to you kind of how we do board and trains and just get your input on it because sure. I totally get the type of board and train you're talking about. And I yeah. think we've spent a lot of years doing it different. So let's take a quick commercial break and then we'll come back with Robert Cabral. Have you looked into dog training lately? Because these days, it can be so confusing. There's just so many methods out there for dog trainers and owners who, frankly, just want to do what's right for their dogs. 
It would be nice if there was just something out there where you could learn about the best methods from real dog trainers who genuinely know what works and who believe in honest and open conversation with trainers from around the globe. If that sounds like you, then the Dog Trainers Podcast is just what you're looking for. Come and listen to Brent and Mariano as they educate you about all the different methods and tools you can use today with absolutely no bias, just straight up information that can make you the best dog trainer you can be. Plus, you'll get the inside scoop from world-renowned trainers and so much more. Dog Trainers Podcast is a podcast created by dog trainers, for dog trainers, and anyone who's ever fallen in love with man's best friend. If all this sounds good to you, then check us out today by searching Dog Trainers Podcast on your favorite podcast streaming platform. We'll see you there. All right, guys, we are back. This is season two, episode 12, interview with Mr. Robert Cabral. Now, just before we went on break, Brent was talking about, uh, you know, we wanted to give Robert some, you know, a rundown on how we run board train programs and, and just get his honest feedback on it. So let's let's dive right back in. Yeah. Um, so originally, yeah, when we, when we talked about it, Robert had brought up how he doesn't like certain concepts of board and train programs. And so I just want to kind of share, you know, through the years, I've been training dogs. I totally see this, you know, the, how some people can, I used to be a shitty dog trainer, you know, and I think I'm, I'm better, way better. And I'm pretty good now. Um, but it came with a lot of trial and error and a lot of, you know, dogs that I didn't think I was able to take all the way. And so, you know, once you master the dog training part and you have to try and fit in, well, how do I figure out this dog, this human training part? Right. Mm -hmm. And as we become better pet dog trainers, the big key is how good you are with teaching humans. Right. right. As we start seeing. And so um, I'll kind of talk about uh, how I do board and trains and uh, Mariano can chime in with with his board and trains. But so, you know, for my board and trains, I have a, a staff of about six, seven trainers. Right. And in my six, seven trainers, it's all in house. It's here at my at my home, at my facility. Um, and these dogs, we take a, a maximum of 10 dogs at any given time. Okay. So with, within six to seven trainers, we have 10 dogs, uh, being fed, played with, trained, walked, slap mill, you know, uh, having fun, play groups, all that stuff. And so we really want to make sure that the dogs are super enriched as we do it. And during board and train, we require that every week the dog is here could be anywhere between four weeks to six weeks to eight weeks, depending on what we're working on. Every week, the owner is required to come and visit their dog, work with their dog. And what we do is we gradually teach that owner. Okay. This is your dog at a dog park. This, or not, not, not at first, but this is your dog in our backyard. This is your dog on the street. This is your dog at the park. This is your dog around the dog park on the outside. And these are the abilities your dog has. And we're going to coach you through the mechanical skills of how we get our dogs to do X, Y, and Z. Once we accomplish that, once they fulfill their required sessions during the dog's board and train, then what we do is we offer unlimited private sessions and group classes for that dog owner post-training so that that dog can adapt to the being at home again. From that point on, my company never wants to put a price on that person's ability to learn what their dog has already learned, you know? And so I try to make a good, you know, this was actually information that was shared with us by Michael Ellis. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I require that they come and they work with their, with their dogs every day. And since I started doing that a couple of years ago, it's a game changer, a game changer of the efficacy of the confidence of my handlers. Because one of the biggest things that I saw was failing in the old way I did board and trains was you know, they were so impressed that the dog looked better, but then, uh, after that, you know, they'd stop showing up to follow-ups and they'd stop mm -hmm. showing up. So I kind of made it a requirement. You're going to come and learn what your dog knows. And I've seen through this process, people bond with their dogs deeper. People actually play with their dogs because we make that part of the curriculum. Ultimately, if you can't control a dog during play, you can't control a dog during aggression, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So we really make that a huge part of our program to try and train the dog simultaneously that we're training the dog owners as much as possible and trying to make that an easy resource for people. Um, so that's how I do board and trains. Yeah. I mean, and mine, mine are basically identical just because we both kind of got the same advice from Michael Ellis at the same time. We had him here on the show and he was telling us about the, 
he was telling us about his evolution in dog training and and the the big tips that he gave us were ask for more time because there are lots mm-hmm. of programs out there that are like two, two week weeks e-collar yeah. you know like just straight slam the dog through type deal yeah. you know mm-hmm. um yeah which I've talked about ad nauseum. There's, there's local places here in Phoenix that drive me fucking crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, so ask for the time that you need to properly train this dog in a way where the dog can enjoy their learning experience, right? Like a school Mm -hmm. should be fun. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but also to make sure that the owners come in during training and, you know, I'm I'm not going to bother piggybacking on and like rehashing the same old stuff. So I'll just kind of, I'll just kind of talk about why, like at least in my personal opinion, what I really love the most about getting clients in, uh, during training. And number one, I feel like it helps me teach them because they get to listen and work with you in a way that's less stressful for them because they're not trying to listen to you while at the same time imagining like, okay, when we leave this place, like, what are we going to do? Right. Do I have a crate? Do I have this? And they're like logistically trying to plan out the the night with their dog. Right. Mm -hmm. But also it, makes it so that when the dog actually does go home, because after go home, like Brent said, there are more lessons, right? Um, you don't have to like word vomit at them for like two hours to try mm-hmm. to download them on four to six weeks of what you've been doing in like 90 minutes, yeah. right? You guys already have terminology you agree on. You have concepts that you shaped during exactly. training with but them. But here's something that I started doing quite recently was in those follow-ups while the dog's still here, I give the client homework by themselves. So... Uh, and I mean, like, you know, like written typed up PDF homework, because I send homework to clients, you know, who have their dogs, like private lessons and stuff like that. Right. Mm-hmm. But uh, for example, if I have a client who, let's say they're doing, you know, semi collar training with their dog, mm-hmm. uh, and it could be because it's just going to be like logistically the easiest thing, you know, depending on what the issues or the, the client's limitations, like maybe they're older and can't pull on a leash or whatever the case. So I wanted to get them comfortable with the remote and the ins and outs of it. And, you know, and so I have demo collars that are like different colors from regular collars so that they're, they know it's fake or as in not hooked up to any dogs and they're comfortable kind of playing with it and figuring out the ins and outs. And I send it home with them for a week and I, and I give them homework and the homework is like, take the thing to zero, uh, roll to 10 as fast as you can, then roll back down to zero, then roll to 20 as fast as you can, you know, and like, and get them comfortable kind of learning how to roughly how much movement of twisting your fingers equals roughly how much in levels and stuff like that. Yeah, different you know. mechanical skills. Right, and yeah. this is all without the dog. This is just them at home, dog still with me, right? Um, or leash drills, I'll have them attach the leash to something like a table, you know, or hold it in one hand and in the other hand so that they can practice pulling pressure at different, like, different levels of pressure, let's say, right? So <laughs> stuff like that makes it a lot of fun. It allows me to really break things way down like that, which I feel like also makes it more enjoyable for them which makes them less intimidated about doing the follow-ups when the dog Mm -hmm. goes home. Yeah. One of the biggest fears I would see in my old ways of doing board and train is people going like, I think I'm going to fuck this up. (laughs) You know, like the dog's so good. I think I'm going to fuck this up. But the new systems that we've implemented, the owner is able to develop confidence because of how competent they feel when the dog is able to go home. And that was the biggest game changer. Anyways. So that's how we do it. Uh, What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, again, you're not talking about, traditional board and train right right again right. You know, i've seen yeah. dogs that you know they're they're eight weeks old 12 weeks old 16 weeks old the people you know tried a couple things they say you know i'm just going to send them to the camp and a month's going to come back it's going to be fine right and yeah. then they get a couple of videos from the camp and a couple of little things yeah. and a little text and that's like the 1980s Instagram. model of board and train yeah you know? you know and now whether that person who's training that dog is a yank and crank trainer or, or is shoving treats in their mouth the whole time neither one of them benefits the dog because th- th- here's the problem with board and train, okay? Um, mm-hmm. And I'm going against what you guys are doing, right? You're sure. doing a different thing that I'm, than what I'm talking about. If a, if a dog lives with me, okay, and, and I train that dog three, four times a day, I give it experiences, I give it life skills and all that stuff, it's getting that from a professional trainer. A dog is going to, act, even if I meet you at the park and I take your dog, your dog is going to act differently with me because of what I bring to the table. Mm-hmm. It's, going to, it's going to do with you. Now, if you're actually getting the people in there and doing stuff, then what you're doing is you're kind of schooling the dog in the skill and kind of putting a clean slate on the dog and then giving it the information and then bringing somebody in and, t- and showing them what you're doing and allowing them to learn that. That right. is a better way of doing it than t- meeting somebody every Tuesday at three o'clock. Because mm-hmm. if I meet you Tuesday from three to four, then from four o'clock Tuesday until two thirty on the next Tuesday, you're messing up your dog. 
right? You're right, not right. following through. You're not giving a structure. So in that sense, it's fine. But without the owner involved, I think it's mm -hmm. really bad because, you know, right. you can't just train a dog. I can give the best trained dog in the world to somebody. And within three months, the dog is going to be off of its training. Right. And without that, it's I, I th and that's why I'm against board. I don't I don't think mm -hmm. most people do what you're doing. You know, um, I think, to, you know, for a dog like there's oftentimes I'll have a dog that has uh, social issues. Like it's 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 not it's very uh, fearful around other dogs or it's dominant around other dogs. Well, if I can mm -hmm. send that dog to somebody who's got three, four, five dogs mm -hmm. and I can into have that dog integrated into the pack, the owner doesn't need to be there for that. Right. right? right. Uh, the dog needs to kind of get rewired because this is not an owner problem. This is a dog problem. Right. Now, if the dog is leash reactive and then I, I take the dog for a week or two or three or four and I, I fix the issue of the dog and the person is still nervous on the leash, that's still mm -hmm. going to travel down the leash and the dog's going to be messed up. And it, it doesn't matter yeah. if I taught the dog not to be reactive. The dog is being protective of the person because the person isn't strong enough to yeah. make the dog feel safe. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it, it depends how you're looking at things. You know, you can, you can, there's a hundred ways to skin a cat. You know, it's, you have to just look at the way you're approaching it and, mm -hmm. and what the dog, again, it has to be about making the dog the best they can possibly be. And not every right. dog can be can measure up to my dog or your dog mm -hmm. right they, they, mm -hmm. they, and there's nothing wrong with that like not everybody is as strong as me or as you know or as, as mm -hmm. good looking as, as the timing you know, yeah whoever yeah exactly so give the dog the, the ability to be the best they can possibly be and, right. and then you've done your job well I, i'd like to ask you so um well i guess this is a quick preface question your favorite means of training is it private lessons is it group classes well, there, there isn't one, right? I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I've always done a lot. I, my passion really is the shelter. That's okay. where my heart and soul lies because those dogs can't afford a lesson, right? And they have, they've been given up on. Somebody handed mm -hmm. the leash, somebody to the shelter and said, I don't want this thing anymore, you know? Yeah. And they walked away. So I think those dogs deserve a second chance. Right, you know, for I've sure. I rescued them. My wife had a, a little dachshund from the shelter. Um, I've seen some really good dogs come out of the shelter. Um, I'm passionate about animals in general. I think animals deserve better than what we give them. But um, I, I, I don't really, I can't say I have one thing that I love. Preferred I mean, I'm way. Very, I, yeah. I love doing lectures. Um, yeah. I love what I do now and be able, you know, and being able to put this um, information out on the web mm -hmm. for free yeah. on YouTube mm -hmm. and people yeah. all over the world can see it and, and, and really they get a morsel because I don't, I'm not the guy who like withholds the information until the end. And then I say, Hey, join up and I'll give it to you. Like, right. Like right. I'm not going to say the name of the guy, but there's a guy on the internet who's got a website like that where he's always saying, you know, Oh, here's what I can do. Here's what I can do. And then at the end it's like, you know, sign up or get, give me your email. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. All my mm -hmm. YouTube videos give you the basics of what that exercise is about and you can do it. Now, mm -hmm. if you want right. to learn to take it to the next level, yeah. Join my membership section. You'll get more. But right. you don't need it, right? You don't. Mm -hmm. You certainly don't need it. It might be nice to know it or have it, but I'm not mm -hmm. like withholding any bit of information. So right. that's what I wanted to so ask you: was um, mm -hmm. you you have this this ability to clearly and simply break things down into its core components, and you also have this ability to uh, to kind of figure out and like section out. This is the more basic stuff. This is the more advanced stuff. And it doesn't surprise me because you've been doing this for a long time, but also you had a martial arts school. So you've been teaching mm -hmm. more like basic to more advanced modules for a long, long time. So mm -hmm. my question to you is in building your training career, were there any specific books or practices or things that, that helped you become a better teacher? I would say I was always really good at explaining things to people. I, I think that's really kind of more of a God given skill and mm -hmm. a learned skill. It's mm -hmm. kind of like singing. I took singing lessons for years and I'm a horrible, horrible singer. I can't <laughs> um, but, um, <laughs> you know, if it's a natural skill, you kind of have it. So right. um, I, I just, you know, I, I developed it probably through martial arts, you know, in, in having mm -hmm. learned martial arts a certain way, having um, related to it and having taught it for, I, ta I mean, I taught martial arts on and off for 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, it's a lot more martial arts is a lot more advanced than dog training. Dog training is relatively like 
simple, like like, sure, like right. crazy simple, sure. right? Right. I can't imagine why people don't understand it. And that's mm-hmm. why I explain it in these simple terms, because that's really what it is. I think, mm-hmm. um, honestly, and it's one of my pet peeves, is dog trainers, in particular ones online, make it more complicated. Complicated. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, right? you, you make it complicated anytime you're trying to sell something. Yeah, right. well, of course you have to because you have to see how great you are. See, I'm really yeah, great. The ego trap. It's really complicated yep. thing. See, mm-hmm. I'm not great because I figured out something really simple and I, I found a simple way to communicate it to everybody. Right. Everybody can understand right. what I'm teaching. The people who can't understand what I'm teaching are those who refuse to accept its simplicity. Right. right. Which right. is a lot it has of to people. be more complicated than that. And, and I, ironically, I've got to say that, that making it so simple is what makes you great in and itself i forget mm-hmm. who did that quote of like you know somebody like the better you know something the more simply you can put it or you know i'm, I'm sure i'm messing that way up but yeah the, um but einstein or something you i think it was more like one of the one of the early presidents or something. It simply yeah well anyway so so here's yeah. a here's a quote that i really love you know because since we've been talking like since the beginning i've been thinking of that quote that you told us in the beginning mm-hmm. um here's one of my favorite quotes lately and i just heard the, or read this like maybe four months ago and it's mm-hmm. about the art of teaching. This isn't dog training. This is just teaching things, period. Okay. So the quote is, trainers are often hired because of their subject matter expertise, not necessarily because they are training experts. And so while that can lead to expert content, the content delivery may not ensure or maximize actual learning. And, and if, I, if I may presume, I guess, um, something I feel like I notice about you is you're very good and concise and accurate with your words and i think you said english was not your first language it was not but neither is mine mine is spanish so i I wonder if some of that like some of the fascination with with perfect english comes from having to pick it up on the fly like being good with your words yeah you know well words are very powerful Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and if you believe in, you know, much of religion, uh, the, you mm-hmm. know, the, the universe was created with a sound. Mm-hmm. And there's an old saying that the, the, <clears throat> the, the tongue is the most powerful organ in our body, the most powerful tool we have. And it's because it's guarded by two gates, the teeth and the, and the lips. And that's an old Jewish mm-hmm. um, saying. So mm-hmm. you should be very careful of what you say, because, it, it, you know, once once the words pass your lips, they can't be taken back. True. So why make things complicated why make people feel Mm -hmm. stupid you know i mean just because i'm smarter than somebody doesn't make me better than them right you know i can only be better than them if i'm actually better than them by being a better person so yeah i mean i have a fascination with with um simplicity with learn Mm -hmm. with with things being effective and simple Mm -hmm. blocking a negative behavior in a dog and again this is where i catch a lot of grief from positive only people because they're thoroughly convinced that every dog can be trained with a treat and a cookie, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and mm-hmm. no aversives. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. yet that's never been proven. It's only been proven in laboratories that, and the mm-hmm. only thing they really prove is that dogs um, undergo an immense amount of stress during corrections, right? Mm-hmm. which may quite be very true, but mm-hmm. your body also goes through an immense amount of stress during a cardiovascular exercise. Right, but right. that stress leads to building better heart function and better muscle tone mm-hmm. in your body and, and prolonging yeah. your life. So stress is not always a bad thing in today's right. society. Um, we really have kind of emasculated masculinity and taken mm-hmm. away the, um, the, the real core of what truth is. And it becomes mm-hmm. not the truth. It becomes your truth. Your truth. Yeah. And there right. is no your truth. There is only the truth. Right. Right. So, right. Um, so we, we need to be, choose carefully what we say and what we do. And mm-hmm. again, you know, like I said, if I can pop a dog on a leash and prevent a behavior, I would rather do that because I think it's more effective, even though it might be more stressful. I think it's more beneficial. That stress will benefit the dog and the person more mm-hmm. so than trying to, um, to, to cookie him out of it. Right. 100%. Right. Well, and Michael Ellis said something to us that I thought was, was very, uh, a very fair point was even if you, Robert Cabral, or Michael Ellis, or Brent, or me, could train pretty much any dog, let's say, with food, is it is it unfair or unreasonable of us to expect the owner to be able to do it, even if we could? 
And that's that's also where tools really start to find more of their value as well, right? Is you have to teach the owner something that's going to be most feasible and most practical for them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, so so t I'm, I, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're how you're quoting Michael, but um, you're saying if I can do it with a treat, then the owner might not be able to do it with a treat, but right? Because they're not I, you. I would take it, right, but I would take it quite the converse. I think it would be easier for people to do things because uh, the old saying, and this was an old Ed Frawley saying. I mean, really dating mm -hmm. myself mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. where Back he said, a, you know, an owner can't deliver the level of corrections that their dog needs to understand the picture. He said that, you know, mm -hmm. 30 years ago, or mm -hmm. 25 mm -hmm. years ago. And that's true. So it's easier for the average pet owner to lure their dog with a cookie or a treat or a toy or whatever mm -hmm. than it is mm -hmm. to apply that correction. But it's more true. important that they learn that skill, right? That's mm -hmm. our job as a trainer mm -hmm. to teach them to step outside of that comfort zone and to give the dog what they really should be receiving at that point. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Here's right. A, I'm, here's and I'm not concept. disagreeing with what I'm not disagreeing with what he said. I'm disagreeing with the actual reality that sometimes, you know, you're gonna have a dog that really needs to have the picture painted in a certain way mm -hmm. to benefit. And especially if it's a serious behavior. If it's a lunging mm -hmm. behavior, if it's a, a darting behavior, a dog's gonna dart mm -hmm. out the door, dog or, go after yeah. a car, or or you know, a big dog's gonna lunge after a smaller dog um the cookie might not be the right way to do it right, right. no i love that i think i think michael ellis would agree with you 100 percent is there's mm -hmm. that that is a fascinating dichotomy I, I actually really really like that people who are listening play that back is there's there are things that the owner may naturally be better at but there mm -hmm. are also things that are going to be more important for them to learn yeah i like that i love it there you go yeah. yeah. Um, here's a, here's a, here's something that was brought to our attention. And I think it's very valuable for newer dog trainers. Um, the difference between correction and punishments, mm -hmm. right? So the concept that was, that was shared with us was a correction is just when you take a dog who is incorrect and make them correct. And he goes, so grabbing a piece of food and putting them back on the position is a correction. Putting spatial pressure is a correction. A physical leash pop is a correction. A squirt on the bottle is a correction. Like anything that takes the incorrect dog and makes them correct is a quote unquote correction versus a punishment is something that eliminates a behavior, right? What are your thoughts on that, though, that distinction? Would you add or agree, disagree? Well, <clears throat> I've been saying that for years and I've, I've got mm -hmm. videos on it. I've taught it at Bound Angels University mm -hmm. for years and years mm -hmm. and years. I love that. Um, so a, a, a punishment the, the, that the root of the word punish is pun, right? Which is mm -hmm. punitive. So right. punishments mm -hmm. are always punitive. So for example, mm -hmm. um, I squirt a dog with a spray bottle. That's punitive. It's not correcting the dog. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I right. rub a dog's nose in their pee. Punitive. <laughs> it's not correcting right. the dog. Right. right. Correction um, is to, if you look it up in Webster's Dictionary, it's to make something correct. You right. are correcting something. If you, if I said, what's 10 times 10? And you said 97. And I said, no, like, no, it's 100. Yeah. Yeah. I corrected you. Right. Right. I didn't right. say, um, no. You didn't, you didn't beat me outside the head. Yeah. And I didn't smack <laughs> right. you in the face. Right. right. Yeah, so yeah, there's yeah. an old, uh, there's this old German trainer who um, had a really great analogy and he, he, he did this at a demonstration. And he said to somebody, he goes, what's 16 times 16? And the guy said, I don't know. And he grabbed his nipples as hard as he could and just started <laughs> squeezing his nipples. And he said, now what's 16 times 16? And the guy started screaming, he goes, I don't know. I, I he still said, don't know. Why are you hitting your dog when right. he doesn't know? Right. Right? So right. that's where it's punitive. If right. you correct a dog for something they don't know, with the exception right. of aggression, that's the right. only one, right? Because in the natural kingdom, a dog that acts aggressively puts everybody at risk. So if your dog acts aggressive to another dog, he's putting himself right. at risk. He's going to be killed. Right, mm -hmm. right. He's or the whole pack at shelter. risk. Yeah. And he's putting the pack at risk, right? Because we're going to get in a fight about it. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the mm -hmm. only exception. That one is immediately blocked or corrected, whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But bad behavior like darting through the door. Well, why shouldn't he go through the door? He goes through the door every day. Why shouldn't he go ahead of you? Let him go. Now you're just going to, you know, yank him or just kick him or smack them or whatever that, that and that's where you've got to draw that line you must understand that to correct something you have to have a foundation right you have mm -hmm. to build the foundation right. that you can correct off of because you have to correct a dog back to what they should be doing right right, um, right. there has to be a right answer for dogs. them to choose it 
Right. Yeah. So you, you have to start with, you know, one times one is one, one times two is two. And you start building these multiplication tables so they understand how to do it. And when I teach a dog, uh, whatever, a, a go out, you know, I start him close to the object and I say, where mm -hmm. is it? Go. Boom. He goes. Mm. And I take him back 10 feet. And I say, okay, where is it? Boom. Go. Boom. And yeah. I take him back 20 feet. And in the end, I can take him back yeah. 200 feet and he's still going to go you because it. I started right. at a distance. But if he doesn't, he turns around, he goes the other way. I can pop him on the leash and go, hey, no, mm. where right. is it? And they know that, right? Right, right, right. But it, it involves teaching. And teaching is important. That we, And remember, I mean, how amazing that we can take a dog and teach them. Look at Chase to the Border Collie. He knows 2,000 words. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah, right? yeah. it's people crazy. people haven't seen that, you want a, a study in, in dogs, you know, skills. Cognition. Chase yeah. to the Border Collie. It's an insane, it's an insane concept. Um, what are your thoughts on this? So I almost feel these days like teaching owners i feel like lately i'm looking at it like a like one of those one-way valves where information goes this way not that way and mm -hmm. and i mean that in this sense i feel like owners and newer trainers have this habit of taking not just tools as in like leash you know prong collar whatever food um but taking modules like like their basic framework of this is how i'm going to go from here to there and they almost treat it like a race like the objective is to get from here to there and mm -hmm. they try to push the dog through the different modules of let's say teaching place patterning with leash pressure and food rewards and they like they have this this habit of like okay well he did it five times can i move on now can i move on now can i you know and i i i'm trying to find the words to explain to people i want you guys to start using obedience less as a means of just pushing the dog quickly through their their stuff and more of a way for you to gauge where the dog is currently right like it's more of a thermometer than it is a, a pressure point right okay and i i like that there's i like that you can be meticulous with obedience because you can find the dog right not push them but find them so an example was just yesterday i was at a park with a a, a client with a dane we're doing place patterning and the dog uh, is like very nervous we're you know we're at the park and you can see clearly she's like not sure about you know and I was doing this with the mom, right? So we had the dog on a slip and we had some treats. And I would say, you know, so ask for place, walk the dog over to the bed and stop at the bed yourself. Like just stop moving. Because you stop moving, the dog stops moving because she's following you. And because she stops moving, she like nine times out of 10 sits down. And I was having her gauge the dog like this. I was like, okay, so let's see how long it takes her on average. Like how long you have to stand there before you can then take a step away and the dog doesn't follow. So she stops for one Mississippi, moves, dog moves. Stops for two Mississippis, dog moves. Three Mississippis, dog moves. Four Mississippis, dog does not move. So I go, okay, let's do it again and again. Four Mississippis every time. Dog's staying still pretty consistently. And she's like, okay, should I go to three now? And I'm like, no, why? Would, why? You know, again, the objective of today isn't to get to one. The objective of today is to find where your dog is. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so just using obedience to gauge instead of push. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I guess I, mean, I just it, wanted your take on it. I, I agree. I mean, I think people put, you know, so here's the thing. Some people push too hard and some people don't push enough. Right. There right. needs to be a challenge, right? I mean, obviously, like what you're saying, you know, you're waiting to form a sippy. It's teaching a bark to a dog, right? Right. You, you get one bark out of the dog and or teaching a dog to do a focused heel. You're getting the dog to take three steps and then you mm -hmm. go from the five steps and the dog doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the idea is to get to like with you, the, the, the shortest amount of time, you can walk and walk away, the dog stays, or a, like a motion sit or motion down or motion, right, whatever right, right. it is. Right, you're trying to get to that. So there has to be some discomfort, but it can only be there once the basics are understood by the dog. Right. Right, moving it ahead too fast is like, let's say we're gonna go to the gym and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, okay, we're gonna work out. I'm gonna put you know 90 pounds on the barbell for you. We're gonna do bench mm -hmm. pressing and you're gonna do five reps i'm gonna say excellent let's put two and a quarter on right right yeah. right well you're gonna get crushed under the bar yeah, exactly right <laughs> you're going to right. lift it off <laughs> yeah yeah so 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 and and i think that you know we need to understand that there is some like what i said before earlier on in our, in our conversation there needs to be stress in learning in anything whether you're learning how to play the guitar or you're learning how to box okay you're learning how to play the guitar you're going to get blisters on your fingers you're going to learn how to box you get punched in the face Right. Yeah. That's not necessarily a bad thing. 
Mm-hmm. It's part right? of the game. It's part of the it's process. It's part of the game. I mean, the best way that you know people in my karate class learned not to get punched in the face is <laughs> getting punched, punched in, the face. in the face. Yep. Right. It's not. Yeah. I hate getting punched in the face. I really yeah. hate it. But if I didn't <laughs> experience it, I wouldn't be that serious about blocking. Mm-hmm. But I'm very, very serious about blocking because I hate to get punched in the face. Yeah. So, you know, we don't need to punch our dogs in the face because that's exactly what somebody's going to come out. They're going to say, Robert Cabral says punch a dog in the face. And right, right, right. I'm, <laughs> I'm using an analogy, right? Right. So we teach a dog that there is pleasure and mm-hmm. displeasure or, or, or no, no reward, right? However you right. want to look at that. And, and, and that's right. really the key in teaching anything. We make sure they understand, yes, this is what I want. Yes, you're doing it. Now let's challenge you a little bit and bring mm-hmm. you to the next level. Right. And that's in anything, in anything you want to do in life. And you should approach the same with your dog. Um, make it rewarding and make the non-performance of it not rewarding or uncomfortable. And there's right. no, nothing wrong with being uncomfortable for any creature, by the way. 100%. And it and helps it, build resilience in many ways. Well, right? and as long should. as it's done gradually and as long as the animal or the learner knows what is happening. And, and one thing I feel like I, I want trainers to be aware of, too, is you have to teach dogs the ability to make decisions. So yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, but essentially what you're saying, it, it sounds to me, you know, like what it culminates to in my head is um, you're not spoon feeding the dog, but you're not crushing the dog. You're kind of loading the decision. So one just makes more sense because you made it so, but the dog still has to make that choice. Right. And I feel like not well, enough. You, go ahead. You spoon feed the dog during the luring and shaping phase, right? Right, right, mm-hmm. right, right. Mm-hmm. So, so after that, you don't need to keep spoon feeding the dog. Mm-hmm. If you've mm-hmm. done your basics, if you've, if you've really been fair, and this is only your conscience knows that, mm-hmm. I have shaped this behavior 10, you know, 20, 30, 50 days. Mm-hmm. Now at some point I'm going to take the training wheels off the bicycle and I'm going to mm-hmm. push you and let you go. And you might fall, mm-hmm. but you took, you know, you got 20, 30 feet without crashing the bike. So we're right. going to do it again. We're not going to put the mm-hmm. training wheels back on. Mm-hmm. You know, but I'm going to help you a little bit. Right. Yeah. You know, so we don't go back necessarily to the luring phase, but we might shorten the duration to, and increase the reward. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think this is the mistake that people make where they rely on whether it's an e-collar or it's a cookie. Mm-hmm. Right. They cripple themselves and the dog through the tool of the reward. Mm-hmm. True. And I see this with people who say, I, I'm going to train my dog. Where's my toy? Where's, where's my, you know, where's my mm-hmm, treats? Mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. they say, I'm going to go train my dog. I, hang on. I got to get an e-collar on him. Yeah. I mean, I can take Goofy out of the car at any, anywhere I go mm-hmm. and say, okay, let's work. Now, I might put an e-collar on him. He's 12 years mm-hmm. old. I might. I might put a leash on him. I might grab a handful of treats mm-hmm. or I might not. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. That doesn't, yeah. that doesn't um, in any way shape or 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 change what's mm-hmm. going to happen mm-hmm. it's just mm-hmm. the mood i'm in right you right know? whether i'm going for italian food or sushi i'm going to go eat yep yeah and, yep. and and that you have to really look at with the dog how do you how do you really make that clear to the dog that your luring mm-hmm. and shaping has been successful and has instilled in the dog the desire and the and the and the um, reward and then you go from there you take it to the next level i right. love that I love that. Um, I wanted to to change gears a little bit if we can, um, but we also need to take a quick little commercial break. And when we come back, I want to start asking you about your Bound Angels University. I want to talk about your rescue stuff because this is something that I've been waiting for a long time to chat with you about. Um, sure. So let's go ahead and take a little commercial break and we're going to come back with Robert Cabral. Peace. Cool. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to Dog Trainers Podcast. You know what's a great way to support this podcast? By becoming a sponsor today. With sponsoring the podcast, you'll be helping us make this show the best it can be and so much more. From hosting more local events, traveling throughout the country, and connecting with trainers from around the world. Ultimately getting you, the listener, more of the content that you love. For more information, please contact us at dogtrainerspodcast at gmail.com. Or visit our Instagram page at Dog Traders Podcast. Thank you guys, and now back to the show.
Welcome back, guys. And again, thank you so much for listening to the Dog Trainers Podcast. This is Season 2, Episode 12, Interview with Mr. Robert Cabral. Now, we wanted to get into Bound Angels and talk a bit more about that and how you started and the state of it today. So let's dive right back in. Yeah. Um, so one thing that me, that, that I have uh, that I'm very excited to, to share is this passion for shelter dogs and rescue dogs. Um, some people know my story. They don't know my story. But just to preface it, when I was 18... Uh, I got let go of all my restaurant jobs in college and I volunteered six months at the animal shelter every day, you know, as soon as they would open and as and I'd leave and it got to this point where, you know, the ACTs, I was at West Valley shelter, right? Mm -hmm. um, not, not West side shelter, but the West Valley shelter. And, uh, I'd be there all the freaking time. And some of the ACTs would just give me keys to the kennels and be like, stop bothering me, kid, go walk and play with whoever you want to play with. So I would take these dogs out. And I would see that volunteers would come and walk the same 10 dogs, the nice ones, the sweet ones, you know, and then I would see that there are these dogs in the back that no one would pay attention to, or these really shy dogs or these really dogs who are kind of timid and raising a lip here and there. And no one would touch those dogs. Well, long story short, I ended up getting these keys. And some of those keys were to the back rooms of the shelter where the bad dogs were. And behind people's backs, I would take these dogs on walks and take them to the play yard and have fun with them and socialize them and do as much as I could as an 18 year old who didn't really have a lot of dog training. And one of those dogs that I fell in love with ended up biting someone when I wasn't there and got euthanized. And I remember coming back and being so pissed that this dog who I loved, this Rottweiler who I loved, um, who I felt like I helped open him up and, uh, and, you know, he, he really made me feel good about the work we were doing together. And uh, I come in one day and he's gone. And turns out he bit someone who wasn't handling him properly. And uh, I end up throwing a huge fit in the shelter. And I end up screaming at people. And I end up just being, <laughs> being a cocky 18-year-old who uh, I literally screamed. I said, fuck you guys. I'm going to go learn how to be a dog trader. And I'm going to come back. And I'm going to help these dogs, right? And one of the officers, Sergio, at West at West Valley Shelter, he uh, he had a friend uh, who just opened up a kennel. And he said, hey, he's looking for good people. I'm only 18 at the time. And later, he uh, two days later, I would have an interview with the person who would be my mentor for 10 years. And so shelter dogs are such a huge passion of mine. And working with rescues and working with these animals who, um, who just like you, Robert, they need a second chance. So mm -hmm. that's my story. But I would love to dive into kind of your story a little bit of your passion for rescue dogs, where it started, how it started, and eventually how Bound Angels came to be. Man, um, that's a powerful story, by the way. And I know Sergio. He's a good guy. I work yeah. with the West Valley Shelter. And I think, didn't Vaz come from West Valley? Oh, he came from East Valley. Um, there's so, I mean, there's so many amazing stories about dogs and shelters, mm -hmm. shelter dogs that come out and do amazing things, right? Yeah. Um, mystery to me how people can give up on dogs and I'm, I'm not a good guy for that topic. Yeah. Um, th there's a company, really well-known company that wanted to do a TV series with me and they took me to a shelter and they said, you're going to talk to the person who's going to give up their dog. And they actually waited for somebody to come in and they filmed it and it was really not good at all. Mm, right. like, I have no sympathy for people who dump dogs. No, <laughs> you I were just, just trashing them. <laughs> oh I, yeah. I went to town on them and the, the woman ended up crying because of what I did to her because she was just callous, you know, she was going to walk yeah. away, dump her dog and go, you know, go have a Burger King on her way home and then go, you mm. know, go dancing at the red onion or something. Yeah. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I mean, I trained dogs. Um, like I said, on and off my friend, Mike, I did the shelter dog video, shelter angel videos through Bound Angels. Uh, what I really wanted to do was originally, you know, Bound Angels was really going to be just this media kind of thing. Like we're going to mm -hmm. uh, put dogs on social media because nobody was really doing that at that point. They were not mm -hmm. really using social media for that. Now they do. And I think a lot of that had to do with a book I wrote called Selling Used Dogs, which you guys mm. know about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I really, that, that was really the idea behind Bound Angels. Well, it became more and more involved because I was doing these behavior assessments on dogs. People said, oh, I want to learn how to do that. I want to learn how to do that. And I remember this woman, she was an older lady who had two chows 
And she asked me to train one of them, and I said, okay. And she said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, you know, he's aggressive. I'm going to correct him for being aggressive. Well, she goes, oh, no, no, we can't do that. I've got another trainer who can do it with positive only. Well, <laughs> needless to say, the dog ate like six pounds of chicken and was still aggressive. Right, mm-hmm. right, right. Um, so I started this idea. I went to um, the person who was the head of the LA Animal Shelters at that time, and I said, hey, I think you can do better. Mm-hmm. And the guy said, how? And I, I, I drew out a plan. And then after that, um, I had been doing training there and in Ventura County, LA City, mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. LA County, LA City and mm-hmm. Ventura mm-hmm. County. And then um, they asked me to come back for more and more. And then they wanted to do the play groups, right? There's, there, there's nobody who's done, I don't want to say this in an egotistical way, but play groups are often done in shelters. It's a new thing, right? People, mm-hmm. you know, it's been doing it for like 10 years. And it's mm-hmm. like, we're going to take these dogs out and we're going to put them all in the yard and they're all going to play and they're all going to be happy. But inevitably, there's always injuries. Right? I don't right. care who's done it, mm-hmm. right? right? There's always been serious injuries. But I can tell you that in the years that I did it, and I did it with my friend Louis Dato, who you would know from the West, West Valley Shelter. Yeah. He was the head of the LA City Shelters, and he was one of my, like, 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 like I said about Larry, like a brother from another mother. Louis mm-hmm. and I were thick as thieves. Mm-hmm. And um, he was a hard guy like me, you know, kind of like military kind of guy. And, but I knew I, he had a heart. He loved dogs. And we did this program together for years. And I can tell you, we've had, I mean, I think the biggest number we had one time was 17 pit bulls in the yard. And there were dogs that didn't play. Mm-hmm. And there was, I, I, to this day, when I stopped doing the program, I think it was two or three years ago, I never had an injury on a person or a dog. Wow. Ever. Wow. That's a great it, reputation. Not in yeah. one group. Wow. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, when I stopped the program, that's where I stopped it is, is you know, thousands of whatever it is dogs that hundreds of dogs in play groups in being being handled and and they never have because um i always said to people there's two goals i have in this one is that no person should get hurt that's my number one priority Mm -hmm. right and my second priority is um that no dog should get hurt Mm -hmm. and at the end of a couple of my play groups you know uh, one woman was screaming at me telling me what a jerk i was and she didn't like me and I said, well, I said, if you mind, if I can ask you just one question. Um, when we started this program, what, what did I say were my two goals? And she said, oh, I don't know. No dogs get hurt. And I said, well, did any dogs get hurt? And she said, no. And I said, what was my other one? And somebody else chimed in. They said, well, that no, no person would get hurt. And I said, was any person hurt? And they said, no. And I said, well, then I've reached my two goals. Making you like me was not my goal. And it never is my goal <laughs> to have people like me, right? I, it's, I, I really, I don't care about viewers, likes, followers. Mm-hmm. Uh, you 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 really liking me, but I want you to respect what I do because right, I'm good right. at it and I want to help. And that was really the mission behind Bound Angels was to give this voice to these animals that they might need corrections. Not all right. dogs should be adopted out. Not every person is a good handler for every dog. I hate when I see you know people go to the shelter and some whether it's a volunteer or somebody says, oh this pit bull would be great for you. And it's not the right personality for it. Pit bulls are great dogs, right? But right. they're also really crappy dogs. Just like German Shepherds are really great yep. dogs, but they're In also the wrong really hands. crappy dogs. Yep. Yeah. So I don't care what kind of dog it is. You know, any dog can be the wrong dog for the right person or the mm-hmm. right dog for the wrong person. You, you, you have mm-hmm. to kind of match that up. It's like a matchmaker thing. Mm-hmm. And I, through Ballad Angels, went through how to do behavior assessments on dogs how to introduce dogs into what we call leash dropping exercise where two dogs would play, mm-hmm. how to build a play group of up to, you know, whatever, however many dogs you want to put in that yard, mm-hmm. um, how to um, market those dogs. So there was a complete component of this program that um, people would learn. And most mm-hmm. of those people all came through because we wrote grants for most of those programs, mm. learned this program free of charge to them, but we paid through it, paid for it through, through grants that right. we wrote. Right. So mm-hmm. hundreds of people, you know, had gone through this, have gone through this program and uh, successfully completed it. 24 hours of training, hands on handling dogs um, and going through things of, of learning how to how to make shelter dogs lives better. How so many of these people were trainers versus volunteers? Um, I would say maybe half and half. OK, mm. great. That's that's amazing. So So here's something that I wanted to ask you about. And this coincides with the rescue stuff. And, and uh, you know, I also wanted to dive into just a couple other things. But essentially what I had written down that I really want to discuss with you was I wanted to get an experienced trainer like yourself, uh, your your thoughts on a couple things. Okay, so number one, Brent has the Candice Foundation. 
I work with a local foundation here in Phoenix. I'm an executive board member there. And I would just like to know from an experienced trainer's perspective, you've started a foundation. I'm assuming you're still on the board or head up the board. Mm -hmm. How did you, how did you even go about the process of choosing who would be on your board? How did you guys come up with your mission and, and all that good stuff? Well, I mean, I think you should find somebody who you, who challenges you, but yet who's got your back. Mm -hmm. So I picked two people, my friend Carlos and uh, one of my students from my dojo, the person who ran my dojo, Dorian, mm. um, I said that they would be my, my board, my board mm -hmm. because they would, they've got my back and they knew what my mission was, but they would also challenge me if they felt I was doing something wrong and I would respect them. It's right. very hard for me to respect somebody because I think, you know, for me that respect is earned. Right. And mm -hmm. these are two people I had immense respect for. So they were on my board. And then eventually I added to the board Dr. Lisa, who's the person who started me in this. And, and she's a very compassionate person, a very knowledgeable veterinarian here in Malibu. And, right. um, and she was, she's, been, she's been a friend to, to me for years. So she, I mm -hmm. put her on the board. Okay. And there's, is it the four of you right now on the board? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it. Um, when you're... When you're coming up with the the missions, because I know like you know foundations have expectations, mission statements, and making sure that you stick to this and all this other stuff. Um, how did you guys decide exactly how you wanted to go about helping these dogs? I know that the drive was there, yeah. and you could have taken so many different ways to get this done. Did you have a lot of ideas that you had to narrow? Yeah, you had to kind of funnel or down. Or did you have into, one into idea the... that you that you put all your no, energy I, in? I pretty much knew what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean. You got to remember that the, there was a study done years ago, and it was a veterinarian who was on um, on with best friends, and they mm -hmm. actually came to the conclusion that the two things that are leading the leading causes for shelters not getting more dogs out the number one is veterinary care, mm -hmm. um, and the second one is behavioral care. Right, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. training education shelter dogs is probably the the most important thing to yeah. not getting them out mm -hmm. because yeah. either they're sick. And people don't want to take a sick dog, right? Misbehaved, but yeah, they'll take right. a sick dog over a dog that's that's unruly. Like if I see a dog mm -hmm. in a shelter and it's behind a bar, you know, behind a, a kennel, and it's baring its teeth and it's slamming its head in the wall trying to get to the dog in front of it, and right. and, and you know, and, and jumping around, mm -hmm. nobody wants that dog. Like, right. Yeah. And if you try to push that dog on somebody, you're an idiot. Yeah. Well, 100%. And, and that was the other the other thing I wanted to get your thoughts on from an experienced trainer's perspective was the uh, genetic proponent or component, sorry, to a dog mm -hmm. is I, I noticed that a lot of the newer trainers, like either younger in, in life years or younger in training years, they tend to be a bit more idealistic, you know, thinking like, oh, sure, mm -hmm. I can turn or, or maybe not I, but like good solid training can turn any dog into any sort of thing, you know, mm -hmm. and people who who talk about genetics are just it's kind of like this cop out, but right. more experienced trainers that we talk to without exception. And the more we talk to just the more, it's just more, you know, like obvious evidence yeah. for me is more experienced trainers understand the value of genetics and the role that nature plays in these dogs. Yeah. I mean, it, there's no bigger role. I mean, I can take a dog that's genetically not, let's say a genetically, a dog that's genetically reactive to dogs or aggressive mm -hmm. to dogs. Mm -hmm. Right. I can through nurture change the appearance of the outward behaviors of the dog. Right. The dog doesn't really look aggressive. That component is still there. It's genetic. I'm masking it. Right, mm -hmm. right. Right. And masking is really important because we use masking to to hide the real genetic component of the dog. So mm -hmm. if a dog is genetically um, not sound with other animals, right? So it has a component of, of more of a, a prey drive, a defensive drives. Um, I can kind of mask that and I can kind of control that a little bit, but that component is there, mm -hmm. right? And it's just right. waiting to rear its head. So you're doing a great disservice. And this is really kind of tragic to so many people and dogs. They get this dog from the shelter. Oh, you know, he, he oh, he seems to be fine. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, we've had no, we haven't yeah. seen anything. Blah, but blah, he's blah. just shut they down. Know deep down. <laughs> yeah. And then they take the dog for a walk and it kills a dog on a walk, which, mm -hmm. you know, how cruel to the yeah. unsuspecting person Right. With their right. dog on a leash walking and this, you know, this gnarly dog grabs it and kills it and then nobody can mm -hmm. stop it. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, this is where I say you, you must understand these components. And as a trainer and as an advocate for dogs, you must be able to say that dog should be put down. Right. Yeah, yeah. It, it is unfortunate that, 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 you know, I know exactly what you're Denise saying. Denise Fenzi, when she was on, she said, mm -hmm. you know, every, there's three there, people have rights. He goes, you have rights. Your dog should have rights and the public should have rights in the sense of mm -hmm. the public should not have a dog who's aggressive off of a leash, you know, yeah. Yeah, getting attacked. You shouldn't be getting attacked by an off leash dog. Right. Um, yeah. The public also has a right to say, you need to train that freaking dog and get him under control, mm -hmm. you know, and then you have a right to, to, to raise your dog as you see fit. Right. So everyone mm -hmm. has these rights. And as long as all rights are being respected, the dog shouldn't be put in a situation he shouldn't he can't handle. Well, you know? that's the mm -hmm. that is the tank that is the technical function of rights is to right. not allow you to step on other people's rights. So that's why laws, mm -hmm. like in theory anyway, that's why the American legal system at least was supposed to exist was to give you as much freedoms as you can possibly have without somehow or another infringing on someone else's like mm -hmm. you're allowed to drink if you're of age and you're allowed to drive obviously but the reason why it's illegal to drink and drive is because of the likelihood that you will injure someone else or damage their property right, right. so like that's yeah. the general idea so yeah i mean definitely denise has a fair point there I, I just i wanted to get robert's take on um how how did you like for newer trainers that listen to this how do you go about building this like the words or the, the conversation with someone that like maybe this dog has some genetic issue, you know, and, and like you said, masking is a is a viable, perfectly reasonable thing as long as you understand what it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you kind of dance this line of being like realistic with people and, and having these tough conversations and where did you develop the confidence at what point in your training career? Boy, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think people who know me, people who have either followed my videos or people who are my friends or people who are close to me um, and may refer me to somebody say, look, he's going to he's just going to tell you the way it is. Mm. Right. <laughs> and right. in my in my candor, in my delivery, I don't sugarcoat things that much. Mm -hmm. right? I, I kind of just speak the truth. And I think that's a really important piece because I've got no skin in the game. Right. Mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> At this point in my life, I'm financially set. Mm -hmm. I'm my career is set. I mean, I've kind of done what I need to do. I don't really need to build my career. Mm -hmm. right. So I can speak the truth with no ulterior motives. I don't want right. anything from you. I don't want your money. I don't want your fault, your, your adoration or anything like that. I, I, I shy away from that. I'm a very private person. My wife and I and our dogs live a very private life. I don't do shadow students. I don't go doing seminars. I'm not I don't even, I mean, I rarely go out to events because I'm very private like that. Mm -hmm. right. So I've got nothing to gain by telling you something that might not be true. And if I say that dog should be put down, it's the truth. Mm -hmm. And I would be willing to put the dog down myself. I would be willing to put the needle in the dog and watch the dog fade away. As painful as that would be mm -hmm. for yeah. me, that's how much I believe in it. Right. Because... Here's the thing. I've had positive only. And again, I'm not in any way criticizing positive training. I'm a positive sure. trainer. I use treats. I use toys. I use rewards. My wife is a, you know, uses clickers and she's an amazing, amazing trainer mm -hmm. with yeah. what she does. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I haven't, I have a problem with positive only, right? So right. if you want to do positive only, it's fine. I don't mind. I, That's I the no art. With That's that. the art trap, you know? That's it's, the art. But mm -hmm. don't tell me that I could have trained that dog without the use of an aversive that I decided to put in because I've got a lot more experience than you. Right. So um, that's really important. I, I don't know where we were going with that. We were, there was somewhere we were going with that. I lost my tra train of thought well, for a second. Well, so just to kind of get you back on track, um, you have this candor, you have this honesty, you have this openness mm -hmm. that you just said you've developed through the course of your career and everything else. I guess essentially what I'm asking you is if you... Um, if you were to give advice to a newer trainer on mm -hmm. what their version of that should look like, because they're not Robert Cabral, they don't have any of your like, you know, of your history of your, or anything, right? Mm -hmm. What would be your way to help them have these conversations? Well, I mean, first of all, I think you have to believe in it. <clears throat> I think right. you have to um, you have to experience it. Like, there's a lot of dogs that you know. Again, and, and this is the side of it where that's where I was going with this. Mm -hmm. um, once you've exhausted every possibility, 
-hmm. you kind of can say, okay, you know, the dog has been to a couple trainers, has mm -hmm. been, you know, examined, and these are the problems. Right. Um, when people start to criticize you and say, well, you know, you could do it this way or you could do it that way. Well, right. okay, then then do it. Right, right. right. right? right a right. lot of trainers had said to me, you know, you don't need to yank the dog around like that in the shelter. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, all I was using was a slip lead. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And treats. That's all I was mm -hmm. allowed to use because, you know, the people who are so crazy about animal rights that they're willing to, to subject that. Um, and the, the end question, I think, should always remain. And this is the way I've done it a lot with people. Hmm. I said, if you had this dog and he was aggressive, let's say, for example, mm -hmm. and um, would you allow this dog in the presence of your small child or your small or older dog mm. right so that's a big question you mm -hmm. know and if you do if you can be honest right be really really honest you have a like we had an 18 year old dachshund who was like i love this dog i still mm -hmm. cry about him i still miss him mm -hmm. um and i brought my german shepherd into the house when when janet and i got back together and my female German Shepherd had reactivity issues. She did not like other dogs. Mm. And every single day I watched her and I corrected her immensely for it. And the one time we came home, the crate door was open on the, on the um, dachshund crate. He was maybe mm. 17 at this time mm. and we couldn't find him. Mm. And my wife was looking for him and looking for him. And she looked in the corner of the room and she saw Maya, my German Shepherd. Mm -hmm. And the shep the, the the dachshund was deaf and blind. Mm. She had herded him into the corner and laid in front of him to protect him. Mm. So that's what I knew. And you know, I'd seen him a couple times, like run between her legs and stuff like that. In the beginning, mm -hmm. she would like snarl or whatever, mm -hmm. and I corrected her. So I knew she was safe. I mm -hmm. knew I could make her safe. Right? I she had an EQ her about go. her. Yeah, she had she had like an intelligence, she emotional knew. intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, she had emotional. She wasn't just an so, animal, you know. Yeah, but it's because I've seen those things. So maybe somebody who's just starting out, maybe they don't have the qualifications to mm. make that decision yet. And in their best interest, they should consult with somebody who has yeah. more experience 100%. so that they can learn and make better decisions and learn to make those decisions because it's a tough one, right? You don't mm. want to condemn a dog to death because there's been yep. plenty of dogs that yep. other people have said they should be put down. Totally. And I worked with them and yeah. shown that it really wasn't that bad yep. right but totally. um and you don't want to err on either side it's not like well you know i'd ra rather err on the side of safety and kill that dog well that's not really a good yeah error. right right um you need to you know uh, it's a decision i take very very firmly and mm -hmm. you know would you be willing to do that themselves or if you're willing to keep that dog alive would you allow that dog with and again i proved it my dog maya and my dog goofy both very dominant um shepherds I trust them with our beautiful young, you know, when we had, when, when Janet got Dwayne, the Labrador, eight weeks old, mm -hmm. I had him outside with both those dogs. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I knew I could control it and set them up to, to, to succeed. Right. And if not, I wouldn't have put them together. But you have to be really fair. I think a lot of trainers are lighthearted about it on two sides. One, a lot of trainers are too quick to say, well, oh, that dog can't be helped, should be put down. Mm -hmm. And on the exact opposite side, those dogs are those people are too willing to take those dogs and say, oh, they'll right. be fine. Just put them in a group. Right. right. It's, right. A, it's a tough decision. Like, you know, I mean, who are you going to have babysit your kids? Mm -hmm. Somebody you find off Craigslist. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I wouldn't I wouldn't want my young child with some some somebody who might be a potential, you know, molester or something like that. I would be totally. very, very careful. I think that's an excellent so, point is, is there is a, there is a, a flip side of that coin, right? Is there are lots of trainers who take dogs that they shouldn't because they're not equipped to handle mm -hmm, this dog. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Totally. Let's, can we unpack that a little bit? Because this is, this is important for, for young dog trainers like me. I've been doing dog training now 14 years and only the last four years has euthanasia even been a conversation that I would have with mm -hmm. anyone. Right. Cause I was the big eyed trainer who was like, well, I can fix that dog and we can make that dog better. And with the proper management, we can do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, and, and don't get me wrong. Like there's a lot of rescue dogs. I was able to help that way. And there was a lot of dogs that I thought I helped. And then they went back into the home and then, uh, the dog ends up getting put down three months later anyways, you know what I mean? And so you learn, you take the L's and the W's and you learn, hopefully, you know, you're learning from every mistake that you make. And, mm -hmm. you know, as I'm able to look back at some of the stuff 
you know, we, we start to kind of come up with certain schematics and, and understandings of like, okay, what is it, what is it that leads to euthanasia being an option, at least for someone who is an animal lover, right? And, and, and I think one thing that also have to add to that is not just being an animal lover, but you also have to love people as well when you're making these decisions. And right. so I guess I want to just throw that question to you, Robert. Uh, and again, this isn't necessarily something younger dog trainers should. I think I think to your point, they should have resources or mentors that that they can consult with, and and you know people like yourself who have skin in the game, and they've been and they they have more wisdom than a younger dog trainer. What you know, let's unpack this euthanasia thing because it's a really hot topic, and and let's like what would be some criteria for you that you kind of touched base on it, but let's go a little more in depth if we can. Well, I mean, before you make a decision to end a life, it's a it's a terrible, terrible decision, right. you know. But but you you would need to look at if you were a trainer with limited skill set. For example, you're let's say you're a positive only trainer, right? And and, you, and a positive only trainer can be a wonderful trainer. Right? Mm -hmm. They can do mm -hmm. wonderful things with their skills for probably seventy percent of the dogs in the world, maybe mm -hmm. even more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they, they find this dog and they can't get past that thing with the dog. Right. right. So then they need to make that decision like, okay, just because I can't get past it doesn't mean somebody else can't get past it. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, but, but somebody with a, a broader skill set who can start with positive only and then work into more balanced training and then put some corrections on the dog. Um, and, and some dogs will respond to being taught that it's wrong mm -hmm. and some dogs will push through that and keep and become more aggressive. Right. So I think if you, the broader your spectrum of training and understanding the behaviors of the dog and the, and the skill set of the person who owns that dog, cause that's another mm -hmm. big piece, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can maybe have a dog and I've had dogs before, like my second, uh, Sharpe I had, which was, his name was boots. He was horribly aggressive to people and dogs. Mm -hmm. And I trained him and he was fine, but, he would not have been fine with somebody else. Right. Indeed. Yep. I do think Maya would not have been a good dog with somebody else. Now she probably right. would be like, my wife can handle her. You know, she does something. Well, you know, Janet's just, hey, knock it off, Maya. And Maya's like, okay. You mm -hmm. know, because she loves and respects Janet. But it was a skill set she learned. Mm -hmm. The way she was when I got her, it wasn't that, it wasn't, she wasn't that willing to learn, per se. She's right. a German Shepherd. German Shepherds are a very different animal. Right. You know? Um, so I think you just need to develop that skill set. You need to mentor and you need to open up your skill set because, um, in, in defending w what I'm saying about positive only trainers, I have as much of a problem with trainers who don't use rewards. Right. right. There was, I went to, um, I went to a humane society in Arizona years ago and this, there was a, a, a woman there training dogs. And when I got there after she was, she'd left. And they asked me about this one dog. And they said, this dog will not sit. She, this dog just will not, will not settle down, will not sit. And I said, that's really weird. And mm -hmm. I looked and she had a prong collar on. Mm -hmm. And I said, just let me ha take, her, take her collar off. Just put a slip lead on her and let me play mm -hmm. with her for a little bit. I mean, within five minutes, the dog was sitting on command. Mm -hmm. Right. And I said, well, how are they, what are they doing? And they were using the old, the old killer compulsion. method. Which, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Compulsion, pure compulsion, so just yank up on the on the prong mm -hmm. and then tell the dog to sit and the dog would just cower into a sit. Mm -hmm. Well, so the dog was so averse to hearing that word sit, it didn't want to sit. He'd, he'd and if flinch, you just yeah. motivated the dog, it would sit, right? right. So there's the exact opposite situation. And if, if you're not able to understand those two components, you might be good at training some dogs, but you're not a dog trainer. Right, right. 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 Like That's training means you, you can do things like it, it, if you're a fitness trainer, you should be able to take somebody who's in shape and get them in better shape and take somebody who's out of shape and get them into shape. Right. right. Not, right. not just take well, people who are in great shape and, and work out with them. Right. Well, th this is, That's this is the point. part, <laughs> this is the part where I annoy Brent because there's this like, I'm going to go uh, running. Bye. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> there's this like running joke of the podcast is, uh, uh, actually, I really love that you practice martial arts for so long because I boxed for a really long time and I do jujitsu. And, mm, you awesome. know, and I know that, uh, uh, the joke is like everybody who does jujitsu talks about it nonstop, like vegans and CrossFitters and whatnot. Right? So, <laughs> but anyway, the, but here's why I'm bringing this up though, because you're talking about being able, essentially being able to assess and, and adjust your approach on the fly, depending on what's mm -hmm. going to work for this particular dog. 
right? Mm -hmm. That's what experience gets you, right? And that's what maximizes the dog's chances at life because these people have like one or two tricks up their sleeve and neither of these two tricks work. And they're like, well, this dog can't be helped. And then somebody like you has like 16 tricks up their sleeve and they're like, all right, well, maybe it took me all the way to my 16th trick, but I got this dog to be, you know, at a point where they can, they can successfully realistically live with, with the right family. So, mm -hmm. uh, the, my favorite explanation of the belt system of jujitsu, mm -hmm. quiet. my favorite explanation of the belt system of jujitsu was by my current coach here in, in Arizona. And he says, white belts have a job. Their job is to find a game, to find one game and get really good at that one game. All the while understanding that your opponent's objective is exactly to not let you get to your one game because they have their game, right? And that to me sounds like newer trainers kind of getting good at one thing as opposed to scatterbrain trying to learn a little bit of everything at once, right? Mm -hmm. Just kind of get good at food or get good at, you know, whatever it is you get good at. And then blue belts are white belts who are good enough that they have their one best game and they have another one or two really good games that they can lean on. And now that there's mm -hmm. three, you can play for one. And if this doesn't work, you can transition to the other and you're good enough to make transitions from this to that. Purple mm -hmm. belts are really, really good blue belts. Brown and black is where it gets interesting because once you reach the level of brown and black, now you've mastered jujitsu to the point so much that you become a white belt again. And you're just the student open to Because like you said, martial arts are very technical and very dense. And you'll never know everything. Only now you get to start all over with enough technical foundation to be able to try all kinds of things. And I think that that kind of speed, like whenever we talk about, you know, dog training with more experienced trainers, I, I feel like that's, that's the, essentially the, the vibe I get from a lot of you guys is like, you know how to do this, but if it doesn't work, just do that. And if it doesn't work, mm -hmm. then to do this. And it's difficult for newer trainers. I guess I just want to get your thoughts on, on like, you know, learning when to shift from one thing to another, if it's not working for a dog. Well, it, it just exactly what you just said, right? That's the answer. The answer is in your question. When to shift when it's not working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. In other yeah. words, you, you just have to know when it's not working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's, that, it's, that it's ultimately... not, not working just because it didn't work that one time. Right. Right. right? Because right. dogs need, again, what, what I say in the beginning, we, we start out with it. Everything I start with, everything I do with the dog starts with a treat and a toy. Where it goes from there is up to the dog. Right. I've mm -hmm. said that since day one. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. game is up to the dog. Right. Just like a black belt in jujitsu. The black belt makes you play the game you know yep. and takes the game away from you. Yep. <laughs> Get you to play. Now you're playing his game. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right? So that's what I do with the dog. I teach him the game mm. and then I get him to play my game. Mm -hmm. And that's simple. I mean, I think your jujitsu analogy is, is brilliant. Um, your, your sensei's uh, analogy is brilliant in dog training. Mm -hmm. Teach the dog one game. Right. Mm -hmm. And let them play that one game. Then become the black belt and teach them how that game can benefit them and to have them then play your game because you know 10 games, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And then pick the game that you have that works best for the dog. Right. Mm -hmm. That's it. Easy. Right. I knew that analogy would come in handy one of these episodes, Mario. Oh, please. It comes in <laughs> handy every time. It was the one. We literally have a reel that for our, for one of our episodes of our documentary where he it's like 10 different episodes. Jiu-Jitsu, 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 Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> and this is, we're going to add this to the reel. I, I hope this it. one works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is the one that works. Yeah. This is the no, one that it, works. It's a, it's a fun analogy, but but totally, I, I guess. It's a great analogy. And, and I, I guess I was, I was really, um, what's the word? I was really like taken aback in a good way. You know, I was like, I was like super impressed mm -hmm. with your, um, with your answer to a previous question, which was, it seems so simple. And for some reason it wasn't like clicking to me until you said it was, mm -hmm. we were like, or I was like, how do you teach newer trainers to have these difficult conversations? And you were like, you don't tell them to reach out to someone with more experience. And I'm like, Oh, duh. duh. You know? So it's, it's yeah. just fun to, to have somebody with such knowledge, just be like, it's like learning how to train dogs in the first place all over again, where it's the most simple thing. And when you yeah. see it, you're like, oh yeah, well, well, yeah, you know, and it's, it's right in front of your face, but for some reason it doesn't connect. Right. hundred percent. So I want to, I want to go back a little bit to the bound angels. We only got about 10 minutes left here on the mm -hmm. episode and we want to, uh, 10 ish minutes. Um, but I wanted to chat about bound angels university and talk a little bit about the mission on that. 
um, because getting to chat with you, you know, off, off the air, it's, it, it was great to see like your mission. And, you know, again, you're an elder trainer in the sense of, we look up to you and you have more wisdom and, res and we respect you. Called you um, old. No elder, elder, just <laughs> older than me. Um, you called J Jack old the other day and people, no, I, didn't. Like, yeah, I think I'm older did. than both of you guys put together. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you, Robert? I'm 57. I think oh, I'm at 58. I'm, I think I'm, 57. I'm 33. But yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, no, no, no. I think we got you back. No, we're years, older than you. If you yeah. add us together. Okay, good. Thank God. Um, I'm, old. I'm I'm younger than both of you guys. But no. 17. How old are you, Robert? <laughs> 17. <laughs> no, I'm 29. You do look 17. Um, but yeah, yeah just just talking about this mission of, of helping shelter yeah. dogs. And so let's talk a little bit about Bound Angels University. You mind telling the people what that is? <clears throat> Well, Boundings University is something that I founded um, to teach canine behavior to animal shelter workers and volunteers. Mm -hmm. And real simple, I think it's the single most important thing that stifles adoptions is dogs that are, are pent up in a cage and then they run around. And, and although I yep. did play group training, you know, I, I started that program at the LA City Shelters here in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, I do not think that play groups is the best tool for adoption. Right. Play groups is a great, what we call enrichment tool. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not a great adoption tool. So if I can right. take the dogs out and let them run in a yard and play, it's great enrichment. Right. Not every dog is suited for play groups. Mm -hmm. That's crystal clear. There's no person who will tell you that every dog should be in a play group. Mm -hmm. right. They'll say that the shtick is every dog should get out to play, but that right. dog might be out playing by himself. Right. Nobody really has fun playing by themselves, by the way. True. No one does. So, all right. And enrichment can be licking peanut butter off of a Frisbee that's that's mm -hmm. that's taped to your to your shelter, to your kennel. Mm -hmm. Right. What my goal was after I did the playgroup and even while I was doing the playgroup, I always did what we call engagement training. And engagement mm -hmm. training was basically teaching a dog how to engage to a human and get that dog adopted. Because right. every dog, with the exception of one half of 1%, which is a severely human reactive dog. Every single dog is a candidate for en engagement training mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. because I can get the dog out. I can give the dog treats. I can get the dog to sit, to follow me, to come, to leave it, to stay, to, to do little exercise, to go to a play sport or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. This simple skill set is something that I taught to hundreds of people who came through my program Mm -hmm. And um, and again, now that's going to be a program that's going to go onto my site, but it's going right. to be a, a course, a one-time course that will take these 12 years that, that are s s summed up in, I think, six, maybe seven years of videos that I, that I shot through the, those years and make these skills available for, one, shelters everywhere, right. and two, people who want to work with shelters everywhere, and also people who are just like... I mean, I, and as end, you, you guys both said it, there's no better place to cut your teeth than in a shelter. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Because you'll have the widest variety of breeds, behaviors, and situations to train mm -hmm. a dog with. Mm -hmm. Right. A pet dog, I mean, every pet dog I've ever trained was a piece of cake because people would say, oh, you know, he kind of doesn't like when you go over his head to pet him and he might snap at you. Well, mm -hmm. okay, simple. Just be careful when you do that or right. don't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. In the shelter, you open that kennel door and it could be Cujo and it could be Lassie. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. right. Right. And Lassie might look like Cujo and mm -hmm. Cujo might look like right. Lassie. True. So you can't That's a great point. say, oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, you, oh, that dog is like the meanest looking pit bull. Mm -hmm. It's the nicest dog on the planet. Right. Um, one of the most dangerous. Watch out for that Lassa Absa, you know? <laughs> Well, it was a cocker spaniel, uh, uh, yeah, cocker spaniel uh, yeah. that you know that was super, super dangerous. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so so the idea to for shelter workers, you, you have to understand that people who work in shelters are good people. Yeah. That's number one. Yeah, um, through no fault of their own, our system of sheltering dogs puts zero canine behavior training on those people before they get their job. Right. 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 They, okay. Totally. Here's how you put the leash on him. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. But there's no like, okay, mm -hmm. watch for hackles raised, watch for mm -hmm. stiff tail, watch for lip licking, watch for, you know, uh, whale eyes, watch for this, watch for mm -hmm. that. Um, here's how you, you know, break apart a dog fight. I mean, most dog trainers in the world, mm -hmm. I did a video on that German shepherd killed that dog. And I talked about the way that, and I've got another video coming out that, that really breaks it apart, how to break up a dog that's 
biting another dog. Mm -hmm. That's not talked about. There was a woman who worked at the LA City Shelters downtown who had her entire tricep eaten mm. off of her arm by a dog. Ouch. Because wow. Because the more the dog bit, the more they she tried to pull away, pull her arm right, away, and right, she did. Right, she right. pulled her arm away just minus the tricep. Yeah. So Ugh. go with you know, it. The, go with the, the skills that need to be taught were taught through Bound Angels, and it was the only program that I'm aware of that ever existed like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's amazing. It's it's pioneering. You know. Yeah. And I, yeah. I get so much inspiration from that for my own foundation. So. I'd love to talk to you off the air and, and, and see how we could work together. I would love to. Yeah, yeah we're, we're really looking that. forward to learning more about that. That's amazing. And we have just one last question for you that we ask everyone. So okay. we have this, this other kind of running theme through the podcast, which is if dog training is an art form, right? Which sounds funny now after the sport mm -hmm. art dichotomy. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if dog training was an art form, we talk to each individual guest and we ask them, what is what is something that you think you add to the color palette to the vast array of the dog world some people answer with you know whatever their specific uh whatever they believe to be their specific like expertise superpower in, like, yeah something. super social media it could be engaging with clients could be reading dogs mm -hmm. what do you think makes you know separates you from others i mean i would humbly say my my ability to just make things simple mm -hmm. i think dog training is so simple it's mm -hmm. just so easy find what the dog likes inspire the dog to do what you want to do and give them what they want mm -hmm. and block them when they don't do it mm -hmm. help the dog to learn it's so simple can, can i can i also kind of humbly add a little thing to that so sure. having having the chance to speak with you which has been amazing and 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 watching your stuff and, and following you know, one of my favorite, I don't know if this is a saying or I just kind of thought of it one day because I'm like a nerd for words too, you know? Again, I'm also not native English You're speaker. You're a nerd. Um, <laughs> I, I love to think of things in these terms. Simple and easy are not the same thing. Something can be simple right. and not easy to do. I think from what I've gathered, you are simple and easy. And that's, that's beyond rare, meaning... You can break things down very simply, but you you also have this ability to be candid and to have these realistic, difficult conversations in a way that doesn't feel like preachy or like heavy. And I think mm -hmm. that that's mm -hmm. kind of this this magic easy, of it. Yeah. Like that's you almost have part. this you almost have this feel of like, you know, one way or another, we're going to work this out. And I think that that's yeah. more impactful to newer trainers and owners who are struggling. You know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you're aware, I guess, but I just want to to mm -hmm. to remind you if that's the word. <laughs> just let oh, you thank know. You. Yeah, that's a comment. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, keep it keep it simple. I mean, you know, here's the thing. Every day, and I, I talk about this a lot. Every creature that wakes up in the morning is doing its very, very, very best. Yeah. To go to bed, to make it through that day. Right. And go to right. bed that night, whether it's the lion in Africa or the zebra in Africa, right, right. or us. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to get to the end of the day. Now, mm -hmm. some people might fail in their understanding and some people might fail in their delivery, mm -hmm. but they're doing the best they can do. Right, right. And totally. you have to believe in your heart that that is at the end of the day what we're all trying to do. Whether you agree with me politically, religiously, philosophically, or in dog training or not, I really have to believe until you prove otherwise that you're doing the very, very best you can do. Yeah. And it's my job to help you with that. One of the big themes for this podcast, and, and this can be the closing question, um, we really, you know, in the age of the internet where a lot of new dog trainers are learning things online and on online courses, and they're able to, the cool thing about the internet is they're able to get so much information uh, from different different people, different trainers, all those things. But one thing about the internet, uh, very different than, you know, the way I grew up with a mentor was, you know, what's on the internet is not necessarily wrong. However, it can be incomplete. And one of our beliefs, and tell me if you agree or not, is the only way you can create complete understanding is through time and through mem and through mentorship. Right. And, and having someone who can help you troubleshoot problems, someone you can bounce ideas off of, like even me and Mariano, 
we bounce ideas off of each other all the time. You know, I've, I've, I've been, I have a couple more years on, on Mariano and you know, last time he was in LA, I said, dude, I need help with this dog. And he just showed me like, just think outside the box, dude. I was, my head was so stuck in a box that he was able to help me out, you know? And so what, what are your thoughts on mentorship and just be patient, take your time? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I think it's very, very valuable. There is an old saying um, in, in martial arts, I go back to martial arts in mm -hmm. coming full circle on this whole thing. Um, and the, the old saying was, don't observe the master doing his craft, observe the master at all times in between doing his craft. Mm -hmm. mm. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of mentorship personally. I mean, I, I think it's a good, I, I think it is a valuable tool. I think if you mm -hmm. can find somebody who you like the way they work, mm -hmm. um, and, and learn from them, I think it's a good thing. Like I, there's people that I would want to learn from and people I have learned from mm -hmm. right, by watching them or, or observing them or, t or talking to them or just being around them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm just, the reason I say I'm bad at the mentorship thing is because I don't take people on to me because I've got these weird privacy issues that I sure. just can't have mm -hmm. somebody following me around. It, mm -hmm. it, it's, it gives me the willies. I just get weird. And I'm not big on being adored. Like I don't mm -hmm. consider mm -hmm. anybody who watches my stuff a fan. I've never, I don't use that mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. I'll say mm -hmm. a follower, a student, you know, or something like that, a friend. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I don't like the word fan. I don't want to be a movie star or famous or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I just want to do what I'm doing. And if it helps people, fantastic. Right. Yeah. So um, the information, there's, there's a lot of information on the internet. You can learn as much from the bad information as from the good information. Mm -hmm. My advice to anybody is to look at the information you get. Don't try to look at too much information because it's overwhelming and make your choices based on that. And then you will be the best trainer, if that's yeah. what you want to be, yeah. mm -hmm. that you can possibly be. You might be better than you ever aspire to, or you might struggle. Yeah, That's going to be your lot in life. But enjoy that lot in life because it's the only one you got. Would you say your growth as a dog trainer is related to your growth as a person. Um, yeah, I, I would, I would think so. But I mean, I came to dog training as a profession quite late in life. Right. right. I mean, I didn't start well, until I was in more as like 40s. a general, as a general, like, cause yeah. I, re I remember when I was young, you know, I was 18 and Keeler was the easiest, mm -hmm. most effective way of getting certain results. Mm -hmm. But as I grew as a person, as my heart got bigger, as my awareness got bigger, as my mind opened up, you know, and I started growing as a human being, I started seeing that my training changed. You know, the things well, that I looked just, for changed. Just in that, right? So people always go to the Keeler thing. Mm -hmm. Keeler was way out of his time. True. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And although some of his methodologies we disagree with, mm -hmm. it's because of those methodologies, yeah. those thought processes that we've come to where we've come to. He's, he was an amazing person like in that. I mean, people, some people didn't like him as a person. Mm -hmm. I never met him. Mm -hmm. I know people who have. I'm not forming any judgment on the man. Mm -hmm. Some of his methodologies, most of his methodologies was, 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 was groundbreaking. Mm hmm. And through the evolution of what, I mean, look at Edison. Edison's light bulbs didn't, they were, they sucked. <laughs> right. Right. But now we've got LED light bulbs because he made the LED, because he made the regular incandescent bulb. Right. So because of Keeler putting these practices out there, mm -hmm. we now have evolved to so much more. So we do right. owe him a debt of gratitude. 100%. Like we owe other trainers yeah. a debt of gratitude. You know, there's a lot of trainers out there. Um, but yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Choose your information and grow as you grow, and you'll grow as a flower. Not every rose that grows is beautiful, right. but they're all roses. Right. right. I love that. Robert, it's been such a pleasure. That. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, guys. Pleasure being on. All righty, guys. We want to thank everyone for listening to Season 2, Episode 12, our interview with Robert Cabral. Uh, those of you guys who are interested in following him on Instagram, go ahead and check him out at Robert Cabral. That's Robert, C-A-B-R-A-L. You guys can also check out some of his books that he's written on the rescue world, uh, Selling Used Dogs, released in 2011, and Desperate Dogs, Determined Measures from 2012. 
Um, go ahead and check him out also on his uh, boundangels.org if you guys want to check out the Bound Angels Project and be a part of that. Uh, really excited to have you on, Robert. We want to thank you so much. Again, my name is Brent Labrada. That guy's Mariano Alvarez. And thank you again to Robert Cabral. We'll see you guys again in Season 2, Episode 13. Peace. Thank you for listening to the Dog Trainers Podcast, a podcast created by dog trainers, for dog trainers, or anyone who's ever fallen in love with man's best friend. We really hope that you enjoyed this episode and can't wait to be back with you guys. Be sure to follow us at Dog Trainers Podcast on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. And don't forget to punch the hell out of that subscribe button and leave us a review. Remember guys, this is your podcast. You're the best listeners in the world and we'll see you next time.